Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Council Gary Crawford. I'm the chair of the Budget Committee. The clerk has confirmed that we do have quorum, and I'd like to call this meeting, special meeting of the Budget Subcommittee to order. Today's meeting is being held on in person at Scarborough Civic Centre. Members of the public who are registered to speak today are participating by video conference on WebEx, and we also have some people here in the room at Scarborough Civic Centre. Today, uh, the meeting is being streamed live on YouTube, and you can find the list of speakers for this session on toronto.ca slash council. And I ask for your patience. If we experience any delays or technical challenges, uh, we, we tend to have one or two a day, so just be patient with us if that happens. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe. Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. First order of business, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Interest Conflict of Interest Act? Oh, can, I bear, uh, can we... Can you maybe put a bit more volume on it? I'm pretty close to it. Okay, of the Budget Committee that are here today to listen to public presentations. Our other colleagues, Councillor Nunziata, Crisanti, and Alejandro Bravo are here, me are meeting out in Etobicoke, same time from 1.30 to 4.30, and then from 6 to, well, 6 and beyond until we've listened to everybody. The clerk has posted the speakers list online at toronto.ca slash council. If you click on the speakers button for today's meeting, you'll be able to see the complete list of names. For the public who are speaking today, here's how the process works. You will have five minutes to speak to us. Um, if you are online, uh, you have a choice of speaking to us verbally or you can click on your video too so we can, we can see you. Um, please activate the microphone um, just before we'll give you permission to do that. Um, I have a list of names here. There's approximately 30 people that we'll be uh, listening to today. Um, in order, I will go every three. So I'll, I'll mention the first three, and then we'll continue down that so you get a sense of where you are at on the list. But again, you can get online if you want to have a look at where you're at. After you have your five minutes, I will probably, or just before five minutes, actually, I'll give you a little uh, poke or nudge to let you know that uh, usually about five seconds before, just in case you go over that, you'll have to wrap up. Once you're finished, you'll have uh, maybe potentially have some questions from any of the other councillors who are with us today. And again, we have uh, Councillor Thompson and Moise uh, to my left who are part of the subcommittee who could ask you questions. This is the public's opportunity to speak to the 2023 operating and capital budgets. Um, it's also our opportunity to consider your comments and the comments that will be coming uh, before us this afternoon, this evening, and, and yesterday as we look at making recommendations that will be going to next week, uh, the Budget Committee. We'll be looking to do recommendations that will go from Budget Committee to the Mayor and then to Council on February 14th. Why don't we, so I'll, I'll name off the first three speakers and then I'll start with the first speaker. The first three speakers are Don Booth, Nicole Anassis, and Nazma Kanam. Don, I believe you are here, but you are here virtually online. I'm here. Yes, you are. Thank you. Go ahead, you'll have five minutes. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm speaking to you today from the other side of the coin. Most speakers have talked about how to spend money. I'd like to talk about where we can find some money to spend. And I'll also speak a little bit about citizen input. There isn't enough money to run the city properly, and there hasn't been enough for years, decades in fact. It's time to fund our city properly. There's talk of taking 1% from the sales tax. This would net us somewhere between 750 and a billion dollars each year. And I just hope that Mayor Tory's most diplomatic efforts will succeed. This would be just great. A staff report titled 2021 Updated Assessment of Revenue Options examined a commercial parking tax. 
A commercial parking tax of between 50 cents and 150 uh, and a dollar 50 per day per space will yield between 191 and 575 million dollars each year. The program will take about 18 months to implement and we should do this. Um, if we do, we will not be alone. New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Montreal, Vancouver all have some form of this tax. To apply this new tax fairly, I have two suggestions. First, calculate the amount of tax by distance from good transit. Maximum at Maine and Danforth, where I live, near zero near the zoo or in Rexdale. Secondly, small businesses with only one or maybe two spaces should be exempt. It's been proposed that this tax be dedicated to transit. And if that were the case, we would get noticeably better transit and we could take cars off the road. Compared to increasingly worse congestion and, and increasingly worse service, I think that people will support this tax. Now, we're counting on contributions from Ottawa and Queens Park. If they fall short, I suggest we consider walking away from the gardener or at least putting it on hold. The total cost of reconfiguring the gardener is $1.8 billion, and we're currently spending around $200 million a year on it. This might sound like a radical move, but when viewed in the context of the broader fiscal state of things, I'd say we have no choice. Um, and just a couple of words about citizen input. Um, I think it's great that anyone can speak to this committee about the budget. I'm sorry to say that when input comes at the end of the process, there's room for little more than one or two items. New ideas, even really good ideas, are for next year, maybe. Let's reserve one day at the beginning of the process. For example, I'd like to suggest one of my own brilliant ideas. Buildings are the greatest source of greenhouse gas in the city, and most of that comes from natural gas. The price of natural gas is going up, and we need to generate more electricity to power heat pumps to replace that natural gas. What if we levy a charge to connect new buildings to natural gas or to expand an existing connection? Then, what if we use that money to provide a subsidy to the cost of connecting solar power to the grid? It's expensive to connect to the grid, but we need that extra power. And along the same lines, Perhaps a reminder of the strong neighborhood strategy at the beginning of the budget process will see that program fully and generously funded so that we don't feel the need at the end of the process to, to find an additional $50 million for the police at the last minute. Toronto used to be known as New York is run by the Swiss. Sorry to say we're not now and haven't been for a long time but we can become that again. I appreciate the committee's time and attention. I hope that the committee and the mayor will find a way to use the pressure of the COVID emergency to recast the city's financial structure to be truly balanced so that we can begin to consider the value as uh, above the cost of what we do. Thank you. Thank you very much for your deputation. Are there questions? Councillor Thompson has a question for you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and through you to Mr. Booth. Mr. Booth, thank you very much for your very thoughtful and effective uh, presentation today. I just wanted to ask you a question with respect to the parking levy, um, and no doubt you know we have looked at it for some time now and reports are coming forward. I don't know what the status of that is today. However, in light of the last two years with respect to COVID, would you suggest that we look at implementing that as part of a go forward currently, or do we wait until such time that businesses have rebounded in order to implement such a levy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I really appreciate I appreciate your question, and I gave it a lot of thought before suggesting that we move forward with it. Um, it's going to take 18 months to really get going. Um, I think that uh, small business has suffered the most, and um, I think those are the kind of businesses that have only one or two parking spaces, and I think they should be exempt. 
Um, I mean, we could also have an exemption based on square footage, or I, I'm sure there are other um, kind of standard measurements of what small business is. But the cost per space of a maximum of a dollar fifty a day. I, I think if a building is even just holding on by its fingernails, that it can probably handle a dollar fifty a day per space. Because I think that businesses that have a lot of spaces, um, I, I, I just, I, I, I just think that they would <clears throat> be more like corporations and their chances of having survived and beginning to um, right themselves or beyond beginning, um, I think I think we'll be okay. I, I don't think we're going to hurt anybody with this. Thank you very much for your response, Mr. Booth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge uh, Councillor Myers, who is uh, joining us here this afternoon. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Myers, uh, just, uh, just to talk a bit, a bit, bit, so boom, try that again, Booth, Mr. Booth. Councillor Myers, okay, got the two of them correct there. Um, with regard to, uh, you mentioned the numbers, uh, $100 million upwards of $500 million. Um, I believe the larger number looks at every uh, parking space in um, the city. Uh, you mentioned exemptions. So when you're looking at exemptions, um, you know, small businesses, it doesn't make sense that we would be, um, you know, putting a charge on them. It's strip malls out in Scarborough, out in Etobicoke, when you're looking at all these strip malls. So are you, ex are you expecting when we're looking at this to, to charge those kind of areas uh, or not? Well, I, I think it depends on um, how many spaces there are. Um, I, I, I know that in a lot of cases, um, in developments like strip malls, that, um, space, that spaces are allocated per store. You know, your rent includes X number of spaces as part of the calculation. So, you know, if, this, if the store is kind of responsible for one or two spaces, leave them alone. Um, if there's more than that, then there's a modest fee. So, but, you know, I mean, you're talking about a couple of bucks a day here. It's not it's not huge money. So again, so that's an interesting distinction there. You you mentioned that uh, in these strip malls that you would, if there's one or two spaces, three or four spaces, you would you would charge the actual owner um, the money instead of the the person who would be using the parking space. Is that correct? You, it, the tax could be implemented in all different kinds of ways. I'm, I mean, a, a strip mall could decide um, to uh, to charge people. You know, it, it could decide could have a separate parking fee um, or the landlord could take it or it could be charged directly to the to the rent of um, each business. Um, honestly, uh, I, I haven't thought it through to that extent and I think there should be a certain amount of flexibility offered. Yeah, and again, when you're looking at, you know, large malls across the city, you got the Yorkdales, you got the Scarborough Town Center right across from us. So when you're looking at parking downtown, you go into a parking space, you're going to be charged an extra dollar fifty when you go out to pay. But when you're looking at the logistics of, you know, administering this with the larger malls, so how would they be charging the individuals who are coming into the malls, coming into the parking spaces? Or is this, again, just a tax added on to the rents of all of the people who are in the mall? And again, and how do, again, this, this parking levy has been suggested this is a parking levy on people who drive, but how do you administer? And this is one of the challenges that we the report uh, brought out a couple of years ago, and this is prior to the pandemic, is how do you charge um, large parking lot owners um, for the ability, you know, it could be a buck fifty, but it, frankly, this will end up being a tax on businesses as opposed to a tax or a levy on people who drive. Wouldn't that be correct? I'm not sure that it's entirely correct. I want I want to stress one thing before I more fully answer. We're talking about a maximum of a dollar fifty per day per space, not per hour. So, you, you know, if you park for an hour, I don't think you would expect much of a, a of a fee for that. And again, I I think really we have to be flexible with the way the money is collected. It's um it's charged per space. And if um, a, a development like a mall allocates a certain number of spaces per store, then the mall can directly charge specifically a tax for those spaces, um, add it to the rent, um, you know, whatever works. Um, there, there are different financial arrangements 
between landlords and tenants. And I think they should be allowed to deal with this fee in the way that works best for them. Okay, and I think it's just my last question with regard to what Councillor Thompson mentioned. Um, this is really, a, you know, again, we're looking coming out of the, the pandemic, the burden. I mean, we are doing from a city's perspective what we can to ensure to every business, small and large, has an opportunity to succeed. Um, this, from what I'm looking at, is really a tax on business. And you're comfortable with doing this tax on business in a post-pandemic world. I, I am, and I, and I say that with the hope that if this can contribute to really good transit, the kind of transit where you say, why would I drive, um, that I think it will ultimately help business. Thank you. You know, if you can't get there, if it's a pain to, 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 to get to a store to go shopping, then you're, you're not going to go. It should, it should be really good transit so that it's easy to get around. Thank you. Councillor Moyes has a question for you. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, Mr. Booth. Can you hear me? Is this working? Uh, are you able to hear me, Mr. Booth? Thank you for your... Uh, yes, I am. Thank you for your delegation. So you mentioned uh, Montreal uh, and uh, Vancouver and Chicago and New York. They all have parking levies, commercial parking levies. Are they all universal, uniform, or are they uh, geared towards uh, the city itself? I, I don't, I, I didn't look into it enough to, to know the details of how, how these levies are, um, are, are implemented. Um, I know that some of them have different rates depending upon the section of the city where the lot is, is located. Um, some of them are charged only to parking lots where you have to pay to park. Um, but I, I really don't know the details, and I can't speak to, to it in any kind of detail. Okay, fair enough. I know that I think it's, it's important to point out that technology has advanced um, to the point where I'm sure uh, we can use technology to, um, to implement these, uh, this fee gracefully and efficiently. Unfairly. Okay, here's a. I mean, I know the answers to these questions, but I cannot give it to them to you, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, I'll ask another question. <laughs> I'll ask another question. Um, sure. Is it the intent for these parking levies to be um, paid by the um, landowner or by the um, individual person who's renting the spot? I think it could be either. I think whatever works best for a, a, a particular uh, uh, commercial location, you know, it depends on, on the um, financial relationship uh, be between the landlord and the tenant business, or it, it just it depends. There's just too many situations. Mm -hmm. I don't think we, we should um, uh, tie people's hands. Mm -hmm. And regarding, in regards to a park and levy, if it were to be implemented here in Toronto, is it the, who decides how this is structured? Is it the council or is it the individual themselves? I'm not sure I understand your question. What do you mean by how it is structured? Well, if this, if this park and levy were to come into effect here in Toronto, your assumption would be that you know, it would be the city council here that would determine how it would be um, implemented. For example, uh, there could right. be a different rate, let's say, in the core of the downtown versus the suburbs here in Scarborough, where I'm at today. Um, it, it, it certainly should be, yeah. It could be the council that decides whether um, uh, schools or, or religious uh, institutions are exempt. Would that be your assumption? Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I totally agree, yes. All right. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Booth. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Next, we have Nicole Anassis. Nicole is with us today. Welcome, Nicole. I'll get the mic on for you, and then you're all set. 
Oh, I think I maybe press the uh, button yourself. You have to hold it. No, just hold it. Just press it once. We're okay. good. We can hear you now. Awesome. My name is Nicole Anassis, and I'm a volunteer with Progress Toronto and Scarborough Environmental Association. I was struggling to think of what to write today to present as a deputation, but my sister told me a story of her commute home last night that I think is very indicative of the state of our city. She was coming home from a date, and the man suggested that he order her an Uber because it's safer, and after being harassed multiple times by Uber drivers on her way home, because she's a five-foot-nothing small woman, she decided to take the TTC, and she responded with, I actually love taking the TTC home. Uh, she got out of the station and went to board the streetcar and sees a man appearingly dead half underneath the streetcar with his girlfriend frantically crying above him. As she called 911, as she moved through the crowd of people just standing there and watching him lifeless underneath the streetcar, she heard the TTC driver call out to her, I saw her pull him off the streetcar. So this means that this man had been unconscious for an unknown amount of time, definitely longer than the time it took my sister to call 911, and nobody did anything. And in the middle of a mental health crisis, a drug overdose crisis, city council is deciding to police and to have increased presence of TTC constables. What are the chances of one of the new constables being at present at that time and able to help that man? 50 constables is not the answer. Increased police is not the answer. TTC constables have the same capacity to respond to crises as police officers. And after the results of the 2022 study on racism, the systemic racism of the Toronto police, are we really thinking that TTC constables are any better? It is founded within the policing system that there is increased targeting to marginalized people, specifically black and indigenous people. There are no necessarily understandings statistically of the nuances of combined prejudice resulting from those who have mental health struggles or drug use issues. Every dollar that is spent on policing our communities is a dollar ripped away from making our communities safe. It is imperative that city council make sure that people feel safe on their commutes home and in their communities. Safety and security is not founded through policing. Safety and security is found when citizens are cared for through increased affordability and mental health supports. It's, it is found when people know that in times of crisis, someone who is trained to help them, unprejudiced, will be there and not just watch them lying underneath a streetcar. Policing is not the answer to our safety needs. Every dollar ripped away from our community is a dollar spent in the wrong direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. So hold on, let's see if there's any questions. No, there are Oh, Councillor Myers actually does have a question for you. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Uh, what would be your suggestions to help that man on the TTC? When that people- you're not seeing in the budget. Sorry. Um, when people don't feel safe to call emergency services, which has been a very uh, resounding answer within the people and communities that I'm in, they're not willing to call emergency support. So acknowledging that there is systemic racism in the police is not enough, and there's not being enough work done on um, community response units. That's not being sent uh, as part of one of the responses to the budget. Like I saw that there's simply increased policing that the city wants to invest in, but there isn't, even though I would prefer not the police to have a community response team, um, there aren't enough budgets allowed for um, actual response units that are within the same capacity of response as the police to, uh, to come to those situations. and. If the community doesn't feel like they can trust the police, they're not gonna call emergency services. If there's issues on the TTC, a lot of the time people just stand and watch because they don't think that the people who can help them will actually help them. So I think, um, sorry for like a rambly answer, <laughs> but I think that increasing um, notable and measurable elements of uh, less prejudiced response within these community care response units would be the biggest thing. So in response to the 2022 findings, 
not increasing policing, but focusing on community care. But also mental health and drug abuse problems result from a resounding and systemic issue of the city of like not being affordable. Um, so affordability of even housing, groceries are really unaffordable, TTC fare is unaffordable, moving from one place to the other in the city is becoming increasingly unsafe because you feel like you can't live here. And if there's no security, then there's no sense of safety either. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. There, there are actually no questions, unfortunately. Sorry, it's just a... Uh, yeah, Councillor Thompson has a question for you. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm a little curious with respect to the um, the narrative of the story that you communicated to us about, obviously, the cause and effect and lack there of trust. You indicated that your sister saw someone, I, I don't know if I heard it correctly, I just want to make sure I heard it correctly, underneath a streetcar, was that what you said? Yeah, yeah sorry. So, so as part of the narrative, um, I might have, because I was trying to deliver. Yeah, no, no, that's what I'm, yeah. Um, I'm not trying to be argumentative. I just no, I understand. understand that. Yeah, so I think. there's actually a question that I actually have. Yeah, sorry. So um, I might have just missed this in like my speech, sure. but it appeared like the man was unconscious and looked like he was dead, but it was probably that he was overdosing. So she was looking for a breath as she called 911, oh. um, but he was like deeply unresponsive um, because of an apparent drug overdose. The partner of the man who was frantically crying above him, um, she seemed to also not be well and in a way that seemed like she had also done some drugs. Um, okay. So I, sorry, I forgot no, that No, 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 that's fine. <laughs> that's, that's helpful. We, so you wanted to sort of broaden the understanding in terms of the um, ongoing effect of matters in the city and the need for the responses and you're um, wanting to create that correlation between the investment into preventative measures and initiatives so that we get a broader understanding of that. That's what you're trying to. Yes, absolutely. I just want to make sure we're clear. And then can I just ask you one other question? Um, you indicated that your sister called 911. Prior to her arriving, no one else called 911 as, as she was aware? No. So actually, um, while she was on the phone with emergency services, um, she had them communicate to her that they had just received another call for the same situation. Right. So there was a period of time where this man ODing on the streetcar was pulled off by his partner. The TTC driver saw, all of the people in the station saw, and no one called until my sister came up the came stairs up. and decided to do something. And where did that incident take place, do you know? Um, she lives in Roncesville, so I don't and actually- And around there, okay, Yeah. thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate your time. Next is Nazma Kanam. Kanam. Nazma Kanam, uh, I believe, uh, from TTC Riders. Okay, I will circle Naz Nazma and come back later on. The next three speakers will be Dave McDermott, Kate Chung, and Kristen Verasingham. Dave McDermott, Dave, are you on line? Hey Dave, how are you doing? Hello. Dave, can you put your, we can hear you, can you speak to us? I'm thinking Dave may not be able to hear us. Dave, it's Gary Crawford here, can you hear me? Okay, we'll, we'll I'll pause Dave, and if somebody can maybe reach out to him. Sounds as if, well, we can hear him, I think. He just can't hear us. Okay, let's go to Kate Chung. Kate Chung is also on video conference. I, oh, am I unmuted now? Yes, you're <laughs> unmuted. We can hear you. You can begin when you're ready. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'm opposing any increase in the police budget. You can't end violence by putting more guns on the streets, not even police guns. That money should instead be used for implementing mental health teams, 
to respond to mental health crisis calls and domestic violence calls. <clears throat> Those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. And how quickly council seems to have forgotten that the use of, of guns and drug violence came about as a result of the cruel cuts made in the time of Mike Harris, conservative government. The drastic around 21% cut to welfare led to entire generations of children going to school hungry, growing up in despair. They couldn't focus in class, so they were suspended and expelled and came to see crime as a way to survive. We're re reaping those results. It's since that time that we've seen the increase in guns and drugs. So the way to reduce crime and violence is to end poverty and despair. This is where the city needs to focus. Provide supplements to ease the poverty of those on so-called Ontario Works and the ODSP and the working poor. <clears throat> Provide breakfast and lunch programs in every school. Homework support groups with a snack in every school. Recreation programs free and available to all children in need. Health clinics for all, job training and jobs. <clears throat> Build hundreds more units of Toronto community housing and thus house the hundreds of families on the waiting list. Renovate all the units that are in such bad repair. And while you're at it, make all those new and renovated units universal design. So anybody of any age or ability could live there and continue to live there, whether they had a stroke or any other medical problem. Implement a home first program, house people appropriately and phase out the inhumane shelter system that condemns so many homeless people to suffer on the streets and die. Upgrade the TTC, but do not increase the fares. We don't increase the fares for drivers on our roads. In fact, we canceled the vehicle registration tax a few years ago. Bring it back and use the funds for public transit. Implement a surtax on the property taxes of all housing assessed at over $2 million. Use those funds to build and repair TT, 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 sorry, Toronto Community Housing Units. Toronto City Council needs to stop discrimination against elders and people with disabilities. To fail to do so is to put the city in contravention of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the Ontario Human Rights Code, and the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which Canada has signed, thus committing the city of Toronto. When the city makes any arrangements with the concessions to developers, whether it's in the form of land, zoning changes, tax reductions, or deferrals, or any other form, the housing that's built should be required to be universal design, fully accessible. So anyone of any age or ability can live there. Continue to live there if you're experiencing an accident or illness or just the infirmities of old age. We're all going to get older and we're all just temporarily able. As CMHC has reported, the cost of building a new apartment is the same whether it's accessible or not. This is a really important point because too often arguments are made, oh, it's too expensive. It's not. Accessible housing will actually save the city money because there will be a reduced need for long-term care. People will be able to stay in their own homes. Reduced likelihood of pandemic illness, such as we've seen in long-term care in the pandemic. Uh, reduced need for PSW help. Reduced need for help with household tasks. Fewer falls, fewer ambulance calls, fewer hospitalizations. Better mental, mental and physical health. And more employment of people with disabilities. They're not struggling in inaccessible housing. So let's have a heart and not a gun. Let's make this city the world-class city at Clinton. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions? Councillor Myers has a question. Uh, thank you, Councillor Speaker. Um, thank you, Councillor Crawford. Um, Ms. Chung, you listed a number of items that you would like to see investments on aside from the police budget. Um, are there one or two things in particular that you think need to be the priority for this upcoming budget? Well, certainly housing. And it, it just is very strange to me that the city does not require that any developer building any housing at any price level of any kind in the city is not required to make it accessible. If it doesn't cost any more, and certainly for an apartment, CMHC has reported the cost is the same. Or for a house, the, um, <clears throat> the ISO reports and many developers and architects I've spoken with say it costs less than 1% more to make a house 
fully accessible. If you do it from the time of the design of the building, if you wait and you do renovations, that's extremely expensive. And I think that's why there's this misperception that to build accessible housing is expensive. It's not. Building it new is not expensive. So if we could keep people out of long-term care, which may help save their lives and keep them out of hospital, and, and will save money on ambulance and, and all kinds of healthcare costs, why are we not doing this? Thank you. And so when you say spend money on housing, in your mind, what does that look like? Are you talking TCHC well, housing, example, shelters? What, what does that look like to you? Not shelters. People need housing. And it's, it costs less to house someone in permanent housing than it does to keep them in a shelter, which may sound strange since the shelter housing is so horrible. But if we were to actually build housing owned by the city, it would save money and more people would be housed. It's cruel. Would you want to stay in a shelter? No, I would not. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kate. Next is Kristen Verasingham. Welcome, Kristen. Just press the button and we're ready to go. Am I good? You are. Hello, my name is Chrisan Virasingham. I'm the co-founder of the Grassroots Org Scarborough Environmental Association. I just want to start off by thanking the mayor for looking to make up for the shortfalls in the city budget by increasing property taxes. If we want to maintain a world-class city, we have to be all willing to collect collectively invest in it. Uh, I also want to thank council for their implementation of bus lanes in my neighborhood. I've lived there for almost 30 years now, and the, in the time that it's been there, it's changed uh, the businesses I go to, the, my gym membership has changed, the restaurants I, I choose to eat at have changed. So it's been uh, very beneficial for me, and I see my fellow transit riders as well uh, making use of it. Uh, on CBC, I saw that Toronto was ranked the third most congested city in North America, and with the SRT shutting down in Scarborough at the end of this year, I think expanding bus lane networks will uh, go a long way to reduce the uh, possible congestion that would come from that and any impacts to businesses and riders as well as drivers because as we may forget that buses and consistent reliable transit is actually one of the best ways to fight congestion uh, and we can like, you know, penny pinch and be like, oh, we don't have enough money for transit, but we'll, we'll see the cost later on. Guaranteed we'll see the cost later on. So uh, being proactive in that investment, I think will be good. Um, especially when we see like the Gardner Expressway, like we're seeing a huge amount of money dumped for that. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but if we're not seeing the same proportional represent investment in Scarborough Transit and keeping it maintained and well-serviced uh, going into the future, uh, I question the priorities uh, around that. Um, uh, and also for the push around safety, uh, in Scarborough, we don't have a lot of subway stations. Uh, and a lot of the anxiety of using transit comes from people like me who have to use uh, the subway, I mean, bus stops late at night. Uh, I was once a shift worker. I used to work at Canada Post. Uh, and sometimes <laughs> during the night shift, I would use the bus to get there. Uh, and it would just be me sometimes, right? Uh, and I wasn't surprised because um, there's, there wasn't a lot of like service. So sometimes you'd be waiting 30 minutes for a bus uh, and it was anxiety. I'd see assaults happen. Uh, and honestly, I think one of the things that would make us more safe is increasing the amount of people who use transit and making sure they have reliable service so they're not stuck waiting 30, 30 minutes for a bus. Um, to end, I just want to ask the city to properly fund tr transit and explore solutions like a parking levy. Uh, and. Uh, like there might be issues with uh, businesses and things like that, but I, I think it's uh, council's job to look at, uh, into a staff report um, and try to find out how we can target big corporations, the people who've honestly won uh, during the pandemic and uh, sort of focus on them and um, explore that. And, and that'll benefit uh, small businesses because as we've seen um, from previous pilots, uh, transit users actually go to businesses. We actually uh, are patrons and uh, increasing connectivity, especially in a place like Scarborough, will, 
will benefit them as well. So uh, that's all I wanted to say. Um, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much for coming out. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to the next speaker. Our next three will be Leiben, Gebra Michael, Paul Beatty, and Brad Pearson. Leiben or Lieben? Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Councillor Crawford. Good afternoon. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure uh, to be here and thank you for the opportunity. Um, just probably what I'll be talking about would just f continue with some of the conversations that have already taken place. Um, I would like to acknowledge first that, yes, the, the, the city is operating and is planning its budget for the next year under difficult circumstances and we've all experienced some very difficult circumstances in the past two years. Uh, and so um, I, I, I start by acknowledging that. <clears throat> I also understand from some reading that I've done and some of the town halls I've attended, the city has made uh, assessment of the impact of current pandemic related uh, situations, but also economic related um, situations on city services and other services that are available and made some adjustment. Um, what I would like uh, ongoing kind of an assessment is also understanding the, the situations that some communities, particularly black, indigenous and racialized communities have experienced or continue to experience um, prior to COVID definitely, but also what has taken place during, during the pandemic and how that has continued to um, challenge many communities. And then we're seeing some symptoms of those challenges and impacts that have existed for generation, but were intensified and ex exasperated during the pandemic. Um, and in responses to those uh, symptoms that we are seeing, um, we may have missed an opportunity to really uh, provide a comprehensive type of response. Um, we've seen a significant increase in, in the police budget which may or may not be uh, something that uh, needs to be considered. Uh, I'm of the view that you know services should be adequately resourced and police services should also be adequately resorbed, resourced. But in the absence of any other type of support services that are required in the community, I think um, the, the, the uh, increase in the budget for police um, wouldn't, would instead of um, resolving some of the issues that is anticipated, would create even more challenges, particularly for certain communities. And this is very well known with the city. Um, Taibu has worked with the city in various fronts. We know the root causes of community safety issues uh, cannot be responded by police. Uh, it's a reactionary response and not a supportive response. And it was mentioned earlier on, having adequate support and care for communities um, upstream is going to be very important uh, for achieving what the city uh, wants to achieve, which is the health and well-being of its citizens and its residents. Um, we are anticipating some significant challenges coming out of this pandemic as we're moving into the recovery situation. I think we're seeing some of the challenges and symptoms right now, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. So um, we're very concerned about what kind of mental health challenges are we going to be expecting, particular, particularly with younger age uh, groups and seniors who have been uh, disproportionately impacted by what COVID has, has um, how COVID has impacted communities. And so I think the city should consider having significant um, investment uh, and continued investment. Uh, some of the investment that we've seen during the pandemic um, around social services, mental health support services, uh, parent support services, uh, housing has been mentioned a, a number of times, and particularly housing for younger generation, because we know within the homelessness situation in the city, uh, we have those invisible homelessness situations particularly affecting uh, young age group uh, and also 
um, poverty reduction services uh, that are going to be required. And so as much as there has been increases in other services, I think there's a huge gap in increases or support services for community mental health and youth and, and family support that I think should be considered to make sure that we have a balanced view and we can achieve what the outcome of the city is in terms of bringing uh, health and wellness for uh, the residents of the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Councillor Thompson has a question. Thank you. Good afternoon and great to see you, Liban. Um, can you just um, tell us how some of the programs that the city has assisted in terms of funding and helping, particularly with respect to your amazing group, Taibu, or your organization, the work that you do, can you tell us how that's impacting the community, the, the community in particular around the mental health support and assistance there? So, uh, yes, we've had a uh, good partnership with the city. Um, some funding around mental health, but I think the significant uh, investment has been the community crisis response. Right. That was uh, the pilot that's uh, been funded now. It's, it's it, the first year of the three years pilot. And the report just came out for the first six months of activities that has shown significant positive outcomes uh, where we have been able to respond to a crisis with no police about 78% of the time. Um, you know, one of the, one of the earliest um, accomplishment that we've, we've, we've seen with that particular program is that how people are responding to services when they are in crisis. Um, when they are seeing people like themselves or community members responding rather than uniform, uh, uniformed staff responding, uh, already by by that very uh, way of responding de-escalates the situation for people and are able to engage with positive support services, whether it is engaging them with health services or connecting them to, uh, to, to other community support services through the work that we do. Uh, and so people are engaged, people have trust, people are open to services, suggestions, and connection to other services, and it's also an ongoing support service that continues. It's not just a crisis response, somebody responds and de-escalates the situation and move on. We continue to engage with them and continue to stay with them so that the sustained support then will help them prevent another crisis at the beginning. The other piece that we're also doing is prevention. Our philosophy with that service is, if we're already responding to a crisis, we're too late. We need to be getting to people or people getting to us before they get into uh, a crisis situation. And so all services that needs to be invested into should have this upstream prevention component where people have trust with staff or organizations or services to be able to access it before. Uh, you know, it was mentioned earlier on about, you know, opioid crisis. Uh, people, we, we're getting to people too late, sometimes even late and there's nothing we can do. And so we need to push the envelope moving upstream. Right. Um, I, I would ask and, and submit to you that, um, as you just said, part of this process in terms of pilot, there's a lot to be learned. Um, you would agree with me then, though, that that process has to continue. And the whole idea with respect to the pilot is to look at implementing a citywide program initiatives, yes. which would have the appropriate investment and as much as there's a call for more investment with respect to this area, we are now moving ahead with respect to trying to learn and understand the mechanics of an infrastructure that would be sustainable. Would you then agree with me that that learning has to take place in as much as there's more work to be done? Yes, uh, definitely. I think we need, we need to, we are already learning and there's more learnings to be done. There's some adjustment and tweaking we have to do around the system and how the system is changing because we're changing a system, right? right? We didn't have the system before, we're implementing a new system and also changing existing systems, whether it's 211, 911, what is the best way for people to get to the services? So there's learning to happen. But there are other areas where this kind of early learning can be applied to, whether it is around youth engagement or parental support or social services that we can now even begin to continue the investment. We can't just stop. Uh, and our concern is when we're talking about recovery, uh, recovery should feel different for certain population. Because okay. if recovery is to get to where we were before, 
right. I think it's going to be very detrimental to black, indigenous, and racialized communities. And I would agree with you, but can you tell us, please, your ability to communicate as part of the structure that's in place now so that your voice, and, and, and um, a strong one that is well-respected, is able to provide input into the larger system so that we can design and continue to grow programs as well as you've just identified the fact that if we're basically trying to race back to where we were, we're no further ahead in terms of building back better or building back stronger. Is there a mechanism that allows you to provide input as you've been able to provide us here today at the Budget Committee, but beyond simply the Budget Committee? Yes, I, I think, you know, obviously we have our elected officials. We, we will engage them. Sure. Uh, I think uh, the city has played a significant role, and I, I'm very happy to recognize and acknowledge like during the pandemic. Uh, the city has responded. We need to continue to respond to those issues. We need to have forums like this where, we, where the city and systems, both at the provincial and municipal level, can come together and continue the conversation. Um, you know, we're just one organization, but there are many other organizations. Creating this forum on an ongoing basis where we can communicate, we share our experiences, the city brings their expertise, and together as a community, then we're able to, to make these changes. Uh, so definitely this is something that we need to encourage. Super. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. See, Councillor Myers has a question. Hi, Levin. Thank Hi. you for coming today. Um, so you had said that, you know, there is a missed opportunity to provide a comprehensive response to some of the issues that you had identified, whether it's mental health challenges for youth and seniors, social services, parent, parent support services, and so on. Is there one or two things that you think would make a significant difference in sort of the trajectory of where you perhaps see us going that you think that should really be the focus in this budget? Thank you very much for that question, Councillor Myers. I think two two areas where I think we need to 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 pay attention to and focus and and for obvious reasons. One is a younger age group, uh, because we have an opportunity to kind of shape where these young uh, co you know m members of our community are leading towards. So I think a focus on a younger age group with their parents. Many of the youth programs traditionally have just focused on youth and has left out parents uh, in, in a majority of situations. So a parent, family, carer kind of a focus. How can we really change their situations, whether it's reducing uh, you know, poverty so that they can succeed in their education and have opportunities for self-identity, self-actualization, and feeling good about themselves so they can be contributors of the society moving forward. I think that's one focus. And the, the other focus is the challenge we're facing with our older population uh, and a growing number of seniors uh, and where we have significant gaps in supporting them. Uh, they're also the ones that were particularly impacted during, during COVID. You know, before COVID, we were all trying to get them out of their space and so network socially and then suddenly we told them go back to your isolation and you can't move around and we are hearing for a lot of seniors that has been a huge challenge a lot of people ha have experiencing loss grief and have not expressed those griefs and losses in the traditional way that they have you know used to do it and so now with the isolation the loss we're seeing a lot of not just chronic disease and physical movement challenges, but also mental health and social health challenges. So if we can focus on those two areas, I think we would have addressed the most significant and disproportionately impacted uh, sectors of our community. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Next is Paul Beatty. Welcome, Paul. Well, good, day, good day, gentlemen. Um, after listening to all these these people speak, uh, the one about the TTC. Do TTC operators not get like medical training for on bus emergencies or stuff like that? You know, I mean, I used to work for the city, and we got training in CPR and stuff like that. They have emergency phones on the buses. They have uh, you know, cameras on the buses too. So 
I was just wondering how this emergency could proceed when the, you know, the operator of the vehicle had or should have had training in those areas. But uh, anyways, uh, onward and upward. I, uh, I'm just wondering what the city is doing for seniors. They always go back to seniors for the increase in property taxes to pay for this, pay for that. The same body all the time. Oh, we can always go to them. What happens if the seniors can't pay? Oh, we'll just uh, you know tax you. We'll take your house eventually. But people are not getting, you know, money increases to their household. You know, and the price of groceries going up. What heating fuel went up twenty five percent. Electricity went up twelve percent, which is you know. And then oh yeah, you have to pay more property tax because we have these issues to do. Okay, and the met the gentleman that spoke first. He had the 1% sales tax, which I think was brought out uh, many years ago. There was that brought out, but nothing came of it. But I think, yeah, 1%, 2%, and that way it takes money from everybody, not just one specific group all the time, and helps pay for things. So I, I agree with what that guy was saying about the tax. It should be everybody gets to pay, not just the few. And the other question I had was, uh, I read an article in the Toronto Star the other day, and it said the, uh, the mayor's office is getting a 37% funding boost. It also said that uh, councillors got a 6.7% raise this year, and last year they got roughly a $2,800 raise in their salaries. And then I got to turn around and I have to pay more property tax? Hmm, I don't know. And the mayor's funding, I, I can't resist saying that, is this for the new throne that he's got? But anyway, I couldn't pass on that one. And uh, Mr. Ford, he gave uh, the mayor more, more powers to speed up building or something. But in the, in the same breath, Mr. Ford stopped the development taxes that were supposed to be going to the city. So I don't, seems like a... I don't know, back and forth thing, you know, one way he gives them this and the other way he takes it back. So anyways, uh, that's about it for the day, gentlemen. I'm okay. Nothing to ask. We're, we're good to go. Uh, I think we are. Thanks, Paul. For coming. Okay, good enough. Thank you. Next is Brad Pearson. Welcome, Brad. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm coming here to talk more about like making sure transit doesn't get cut and also not raising fares because I feel like Scarborough is a very unsafe community compared to how it used to be. I feel like the west and the north and especially downtown, they do get more transit. They do get a lot more um, service towards them because I mean, I commute downtown from, from Scarborough and the commute's not safe. And I would like to see Scarborough almost step up and use our voice and to say, hey, you know what, Toronto, we need this stuff, like more, more safety on transit, maybe training operators, like he said, if operators could get trained on how to provide medical attention, maybe putting more buttons for people to push on the subway, not just saying, oh, it's emergency, maybe there's a panic button or maybe there's a button that people can press that if, hey, you're uncomfortable, you can press it, the train stops, the operator gets out to inspect the situation. Um, but also providing more express routes in this, in Scarborough because the West has a lot of a lot of express routes, but where we are, we don't have those express routes that run very frequently. They only run in rush hour. Some run midday, but then they stop after I think it's like twelve, maybe maybe twelve a.m. But maybe they run all night long. Maybe they treat it like Blue Night Network where they run express. They they come frequently, like fifteen to twenty minutes. Um, maybe utilizing Don Mill Station, Kennedy Station, Warren Station, so that people who do live in Scarborough have more options to get to downtown Toronto without having to go 5 million bus routes and then at nighttime have to wait over 35 minutes to get home when a commute should only probably take an hour and a half, two hours altogether. Um, and another thing is making sure our communities are safe because no one should have to feel unsafe traveling traveling or even in the area, going out for a walk with their kids or feeling like if they turn around that someone's going to attack them. 
um, my sister and me both live in a really nice neighborhood, um, Victoria Park and St. Clair area. You know, it's a, it's our street is safe, but I wouldn't go for a walk anywhere else because I'm always worried about someone's going to approach me. There's a lot of rough neighborhood around us. So I think maybe investing more in road infractions and also making the, bringing the community, making it a lot more, um, I don't know how to say this, but like, like making it alive again, not letting, getting rid of the businesses that are shut down, demolishing the buildings that are old and real, putting some more new, improved, affordable housing so that, so that people can live in Scarborough, but also have a safe place to stay and not feel like they have to live in downtown Toronto or the Western or the East End so that they can have a safe place. Um, and another thing that I do uh, wanna say is um, better, more accessibility in Scarborough, because I feel like Scarborough got kind of the tail end of it. I feel like we made sure the, the North York was accessible, we made sure the West was accessible, we made sure downtown was accessible, but now of us and Warden is finally being accessible. Um, it took a long time for that to happen. And I mean, if we, if we were to build more accessible stations or push it harder, I feel like Scarborough keeps their mouth shut a little bit or they, get, they don't know what to say. And I, and I would like to see more, especially councillors from Scarborough, speak up and say, you know what, Toronto, we need the proper funding for our community because we are, we are bigger than I believe. I think we're bigger than North York. I feel like we're kind of bigger than the West because we take up the whole east side of the city. I feel like it's where we, we say we're going to do it, but we're not actually doing it. And we're just waiting on the money. But when, when I feel like everybody's trying to say we need help because help needs to happen now. Um, and then the last thing I think I want to say, too, is providing more bus lanes because we got it on Kingston Road. We got it on Morningside and Eglinton Avenue East, but we don't have it on Shepherd Avenue, which would be um, a really good one because that has a lot of service that runs on it. Um, but also providing it um, on... Um, Kennedy Road, because that's another busy road. And then lastly is road infractions, paving the roads, making sure that roads aren't so bumpy and run down and making them alive again, because I feel like we're almost letting Scarborough crumble. Um, maybe extending lines three, getting it, getting it ready. So when it closes down that here's, we have all these bus routes ready to go so that people aren't lost. Because I feel like once line three closes, Scarborough is going to be in a really bad position to say, okay, what are we going to do now? Because I don't think we're doing enough than we should be. Um, and then last, and then I think that's basically it. And then pushing for more transit. So the Eglinton LRT East, pushing for the, the, for the Shepherd Line, going east from Don Mills to McCowan Road, or even more east so that it connects with the Scarborough Extension. Um, maybe putting, a, I may be even saying, like making more frequent service on Victoria Park, Pharmacy, Warden, Kennedy. Um, I'll have to wrap up, please. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Councillor Thompson has a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation, sir. Thank Just a quick much. question. Um, you stress safety and your concern for safety yeah. uh, in the community. What would make you feel safer? I think. What maybe, are the things? Well, maybe providing easier access to emergency services, having a be having more of um, knowing that okay, if I call nine one one, that I'm not going to be judged for calling nine one one. Maybe. I don't know, like I, I think not using all of money towards police services, but maybe having more accessibility, like for some people are saying for mental health, more, um, I think making sure like where there's neighborhoods that have a lot of rundown buildings, rundown streets to provide for construction and making sure that, pe that they're rebuilt, putting more buildings up and paving the roads and making sure they are, they're nice so that they look like, like, Really, really, so they look really nice to be on, walk on, to, you know, okay, I'm on a road that's not run down with a building beside me that looks like it's just been left to just crumble. Like maybe more infractionment in Scarborough? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for coming out today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. The next three speakers are Sean Song Jin In, Danielle Terade, and Bridget Martin. All three are on. Line. I'll start with Sean Sung Jin In. Welcome. Whenever you're ready. Oh, I think you're on mute, actually.
That's okay, saying, huh? we, we can hear you now You whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Sean In, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto. I am part of a larger student collective called Students Mobilizing Against Systemic Hardship at U of T, or in short, SMASH U of T. We represent a broader unified voice of students at U of T that is sick and tired of seeing police on campus, police violence on campus to members of our student community, and poli police violence in this city to members of our broader community. At U of T and other schools in Toronto, students experiencing mental health crises are handcuffed and brutalized by the campus police which are made up of special constables from the Toronto Police Service. This is wrong. A U of T student in 2021, Asanya Ogilvy, was racially profiled by the Toronto Police, was tasered multiple times while not resisting arrest, being unarmed, and had a police officer kneel on his neck. This is absolutely wrong and vile. On January 10th, just one week ago, the Toronto Police Service evicted several members of the encampments in several locations throughout downtown Toronto, including Allen Gardens and also at the intersection of Simcoe and Richmond. The cops nicely gave these residents, nicely, a couple of minutes, up to an hour, to remove their entire presence from that area or be forcefully removed. When confronted by bystanders and community members and advocates, the cops said that they were simply going to send the residents to shelters. When they were presented with the, the absolute reality that these shelters are underfunded, underserved, understaffed, under-resourced, the cops had nothing to say. After the eviction, the shelters that these cops had promised to the residents ended up turning the residents away because it turns out that the cops had not even called them. They had not even notified the shelter that there were additional residents en route. But they're the ones getting $50 million on top of their already grossly inflated budget. It's not housing programs. It's not shelters. It's not shelter hotels. It's not 24 seven warming centers. It's not food programs or school and youth programs. It's none of those. It's the cops. While you peddle this argument that with rising populations, we need more cops, but that's not the case. With rising population means we need to support the fundamental necessities of everyone in our growing communities. It was last Monday when the cops in the private police headquarters building decided to move forward with their $50 million budget request. The very next day, it was those same cops out on the streets evicting poor, queer, disabled, Black and Indigenous members of our community who are also the most underserved by you all. It was the cops that threw out the residents' tents their tarps, all their belongings, leaving them only with two small bags of their belongings. It was the cops that stood tall, smiling, saying that they were proud of doing this job for the city. It was these cops that stood there tall, smiling, asking us if we cared so much, why didn't we just house these residents that they were forcefully evicting it was these cops pushing us away from the tents or violently pulling advocates away by grabbing and pulling on their backpacks. All the while, city workers brought, brought in a giant mechanical claw to pick up the tents, the tarps, the livelihoods of human beings and threw them into the dumpster. It's these bullies that you continue to fund while the rest of the city continues to rot. So please keep that in mind while you continue to administer oppression from the comfy, cushy chairs in that room today. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Councillor Myers, you had question questions. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, what would you like to see the focus of the budget? If you could pick one or two items, you mentioned a, a number of items. What would you like to see us focus on that you're currently not seeing in the budget? Um, I would like a very drastic shift. I mean, if I had to really prioritize one thing right now, it's warming shelters. It's open, available, safe, accessible shelter beds and roof and housing. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that would be what uh, would be the priority, especially with the drastic cuts happening to these warming centers, leaving many, many people out outside on the streets when there's frost warnings, negative 15 or lower temperatures. So, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for coming out today. Next is Daniel Terade. Daniel, you're online, I believe. Daniel, can you hear us? We'll ask for Daniel Terade again. Are you with us, Daniel? Okay, we'll move on to the next deputant. We'll come back to see if Daniel is there. Next is Bridget Martin. Hello? Oh, well, hold on a sec. Is this Daniel? Okay, hi, Daniel. Yes, How are it you? Is. It took a while for them to enable me to unmute. No worries. Go ahead. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Hello, Count. My name is Daniel. I use CA pronouns. I am a lecturer at Toronto Metropolitan University, instructor at University of Toronto Mississauga campus, and a Toronto branch organizer of a group called Socialist Action. And today I'm speaking on behalf of the Municipal Socialist Alliance. I strongly oppose this budget as it's formed because it nickels and dimes off. The work people in the city are the ones that pay the highest costs from high transit fare the high property taxes on their personal property. Nothing in this city would be accomplished without workers. Workers construct the houses, condos, stores, and offices. Workers build the roads. Workers provide health care. Workers teach your kids. Workers drive the buses and subways and streetcars. Workers maintain the parks. Daniel, Music I... And art and make this place a joy to live. Every business, every industry in Toronto one, runs because of workers. Yes. We're having difficulties. You're cutting in and out. I don't know if it's our connection or your connection, but it's very difficult oh. to hear you. Can you hear? We're having difficulty hearing you. Is it possible to turn I'm off? I'm going to try and stop the video and see if it works. If you can, yeah, stop the video feed. It may help. Yes. Is my audio coming through clearer now? Yeah, it's better. Okay. Well, as I was just... Workers do everything in this city, and yet despite the many deputations that are coming from workers to this special meeting of the budget committee, workers basically begging you to provide for the basic needs of workers and oppressed peoples in the city, shelter, food, community spaces, transit, daycare. We hear from our representatives on this, uh, on this committee, how will we pay for it? How will the city pay for this? When deputants like the first person who spoke today rose the idea of a commercial parking levy, some councillors ask, is now the right time to increase taxes on business? And the biggest request uh, deputants have been putting, putting forward is to defund the police. Rather than increase the TPS budget by 48 million over 2022, we can put that money towards the things that people in the city need, shelter, transit, community spaces. And I would go further and say by abolishing the Toronto Police Services, we would free up over $1.1 billion. The biggest line item on that address community safety, address our needs, shelter, transit, community spaces, health care, schools. You fund those and our cities are less violent and we don't need the police. At the 
Toronto Police Services Board special meeting last week, which I attended, dozens of people spoke in favor of defunding the police rather than the current strategy of this committee, which is defunding transit, defunding schools, and defunding parks. You can't have it both ways. You can't bemoan defunding the police while ignoring the fact that you're defunding all these other critical services. At that Toronto Police Services Board, only four people spoke in favor of increasing the Toronto Police Services budget, and they were all representative of downtown business improvement areas, or BIAs, who instead of complaining or discussing the ways in which it's hard to live in the city, they talked about the damage to their private property, increased graffiti and public urination, which impacted their ability to make a profit off of the work of people in the city. These business reps cared about business continuity and uh, business as normal, while the deputants fighting to defund the police cared about the lives and communities in Toronto, particularly of racialized communities who are disproportionately impacted by police violence, as the police itself admits. So how do we fund our communities? How are we going to pay for this? Number one, defund the police, and two, tax the rich. We cannot tax income as a municipality, that's provincial and federal, but we can sharply increase property tax. And what this budget doesn't do appropriately is deal with property taxes as a class issue. Property taxes should not be raised universally, nor should they ever be universal. Personal property where people are living in their own homes, using their homes as intended, as shelter, should have their property taxes frozen or even reduced. But private property owned by giant landlords and corporations that make profit off of the rent of tenants and off of workers who are exploited should be taxed at a much higher property tax rate to make up for this big budget deficit that this committee is relying on the provincial and federal government to fill instead, rather than going to the corporations in this city that are making it harder for us to live by making billions and billions of dollars off of our labor. Corporations never think it's a good idea to raise their taxes because their main goal is to maximize profit. But the masses of the city, it's always a good idea to raise taxes on the big businesses because that is how we're going to fund the services that we need. Big business buys the city council. Uh, we see that big business and people connected to the development industry have donated to almost every single city councillor. That's what they're doing. They're buying your service to protect their interests. What we need instead is a democratic public uh, budget that's determined by the people to meet their needs rather than a budget that's bought by big business and negotiated behind closed doors with their corporate interests in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Bridget Martin. Uh, as I understand, Bridget is not online at the moment, so if Bridget is listening in any capacity, maybe she can call back or get back online. Next three are Olivia Dooley, Louis March, and Li Xiao. Olivia, are you there? Hi, yes, I'm here. Great. You can begin when you're ready. Sure, thanks. Sorry for the tech difficulty. Um. Okay, well, thanks for having me. My name is Olivia. Um, I'm here to speak for myself and not for any other organizations. Um, just a bit about myself. I was born and raised in amalgamated Toronto. Um, I grew up in a subsidized housing complex in North Toronto. I've lived and worked in Parkdale, Davenport, Willowdale, and just recently moved to Ward 11, University Rosedale. I'm a law student and a part-time legal clinic caseworker. Uh, I work in tenant side housing law. I've seen firsthand the eviction factory in process in our province and in particular in our city. And I've worked with folks um, who have recently been made unhoused or are in the process of becoming unhoused. I'm here today to add my voice to the masses of concerned and enraged folks in our city at the mishandling of city resources in this budget's allocation towards the Toronto police. I come to add my voice and to speak in favor of defunding the police and investing in desperately needed community supports, including in public housing. Policing levels in Toronto are unacceptable and demonstrate the city's interest in militarized responses to crises over real safety and care. We know policing has more funding than the budgets for Toronto community housing, shelter support and housing services, transportation and libraries. The wait list for social housing in Toronto is ridiculous. Um, I believe it's over 10 years long for a bachelor unit. 
market rental housing is impossible to afford. We all know that. We've seen violent encampment evictions over the years with folks pointed towards a shelter system that cannot support them or towards uh, shelter spaces that simply do not exist. I continue to be disgusted by the city's militarized response to the existence of poor people in public, the amount of resources you have allocated to erasing this in the past and have committed to allocating again with this budget. My city councilor, Diane Sachs, held a virtual town hall on Sunday where she dedicated time and slides to talking about refugees in the shelter system and people coming from elsewhere to Toronto needing our shelter spaces without any such time or slides dedicated to the outrageous increases in market rent nor the wait list for social and subsidized housing in the city. Painting a picture that the people who are unhoused or who rely on the shelter system aren't simply our neighbors who are from here and can't afford to live here anymore. We have seen years of data collected and survey after survey showing us the same things, that there's no evidential link between crime prevention and more policing. In Toronto, we've also seen years and years of brilliant advocates and organizations speaking to what folks really want, investment in community safety and supports, not more policing. <clears throat> in the case of the city's overwhelming and heartbreaking need, the city is telling us that you do not care about what we want or what we need, but that you will continue to add exorbitant amounts to the Toronto police budgets that we know and have known disproportionately harm black, racialized, and poor people in our city. Much of the conversation around the city budget has been framed from what I've seen through the lens of limited resources, yet you've added tens of millions to continue to police the city rather than invest in support we desperately need and have repeatedly asked you for. I ask that city councillors who work for us and who are invested in our well-being commit to working towards defunding the police and investing in much needed social supports, um, critically in public housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is, oh, Brigitte Martin is now connect connected. Brigitte, are you there? Can you hear us, Brigitte? Can you hear me? We can hear you. You have five minutes. Sorry. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I must have done again a technical error. Thank you. The numbers in the budget, without reference, without details, without knowing how it will work for TTC users, people suffering in housing and searching for housable, affordable housing, and the effect of of increased police has no meaning for me. To TTC, as far as I understand, the fares will go up, the services will be reduced. Does TTC management know what there are many that there are many private developments going up? CO2 car jams are frequent. So TTC action hurts people and our environment and should be made at least reliable. I'm only able to use TTC after, I'm a senior, after 9.30 and before 3 p.m. And even then, during those times, I get nauseous from overcrowding orders and lack of physical uh, and air space to breathe. I counted 33 seats on buses. That is not taking into consideration strollers, mobile devices, and several shopping carts. Many people and I use more than one seat. Sorry, my gluteus maximus plus my winter coat take a little bit more than one seat. Did you take, did you, question, did you take the TTC to get here today to this meeting or your car because you wanted to be on time? Did you encounter any TTC problems or delays? How will this work when there's less service? 
waiting for TTC, I'm a specialist. Frost spies, sunburn, soaking wet from rain, dry ice pellets on your face, buses flying right by me when I was not right beside the bus stop, um, even drenching me with dirty water when flying by me. Mm. Transit and Michael Guerin Hospital. The doctor showed the bus driver your wristband from the hospital and the fare will be free. Bus driver, who told you that? Not to my knowledge, pay. Having taken away the schedules and bus plans, am I the only senior often lost with A's, B's, C's, or whatever bus I have to take? To housing. When I finally got housing after being injured at work, I was initially glad to get a bachelor at 10 Glen Everest Road, where people banged against the wall at all, all hours of the day. Elevators and sometimes both elevators for 17 floors not working. Many people with mobility devices. I called police and special constables so often, but it didn't do any good. So what will it do when we increase our ser police service and our special, will it be better then? It did not make uh, living at 10 grand errors any better. Today, my Toronto Senior Housing Corporation building has a lot of problems with pests, especially bed bugs. And is there anything in the budget for our seniors and many tenants to get effective help with bed bugs? preparation and bed bug treatment pro pro services. I am an expert in living with bed bugs. Service technicians complimented me and how well I prepared during those three years of living with bed bugs. Everything was in the center of my bachelor. Everything was in clear plastic bags, everything except silk, silk screened t-shirts, feather and leather must go in the dryer for 20 minutes at high temperatures. If the material is dry, it won't damage it. How many people notice that? know that? Take note that uh, it takes skills of planning, organization, and willpower to live for through two weeks or more with only two sets of clothing, including coat, jacket, boots. All paper, books, must be packed up for 18 months. Yes, 545 days. That's the time a female egg laying bed bug can survive without feeding. The problem at 10 Glen Everest Road for me was the pest technician. He did not treat the bathroom door frame as it did not constitute an area of being, having to be treated. We'll have to wrap up, please. Oh, yeah. Okay. You're at you're at your five minutes, Brigitte. Okay, sorry. Then. Oh, don't be sorry. Can you ask questions. Uh, unfortunately, no, you can't. We're just here to listen to you. No, no, I am. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions? I'm going to talk about police, but thank you very much. Thank you for coming out, Councillor Myers. Uh, Brigitte actually had a question for you. Uh, Brigitte, just so I understand, have you been living with bed bugs for three years in Toronto Community Housing for Seniors? No, sorry, not for seniors. It was at 10 Glen Everest Road. That was a Toronto housing, not for seniors. So this is a uh, private residence that you're living in with bed bugs. Right now, Past I live in Toronto yeah. Seniors. Okay. Right now, I live in a Toronto Seniors Community Housing building. And before was the same, just not for seniors. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for that clarifying. Thank you for coming up, Ajit. Next is uh, Lewis March. <coughs> Lewis is also online. Lewis. Uh, actually, it's Louis. Oh, Louis sorry, Louis. I apologize. Go ahead. Not a problem. Uh, thanks, Councillor Crawford. Uh, thanks, Jamal Myers. Thanks to the other councillors here today. 
My name is Louis March and thanks for the opportunity to speak to you frankly about my concerns about the proposed city budget specifically with the increase in amount uh, designated to policing. I am the founder of the Zero Gun Violence Movement. It's a collaboration of over 40 different community organizations, agencies, programs across the city. Working towards a very bold and ambitious objective of zero gun violence in our city. Many people think that zero gun violence is unattainable. However, we already have zero gun violence in our city. However, it's in certain communities for certain people. So why is there a difference between living in Rosedale and living in Rexdale? What is the problem here? What's going on in Rosedale that is not going on in Rexdale? And what's going on in Rexdale that is not going on in Rosedale? Zero Gun Violence Movement is about identifying those gaps and having the political leadership, political will, and political courage to close those gaps. So getting to zero gun violence movement is only possible if we have the right pieces in place. Between 2014 and 2019, the city operating budget increased from $11.3 billion the 13.47 billion is now over 16 billion dollars. The amount of money for policing went from 965 million to 1.1 billion now. During this period of time, the amount of money invested in community services decreased from 583 million down to 500 and I think it was 58 million. And at the same time, the amount of money, the amount of gun violence incidents, shootings increased from 177 to now over 469, over a 100% increase, homicides increased. So we have an increase in operating budget, we have an increasing policing budget, but at the same time, gun violence has increased. Is there a direct relationship between increasing policing and also gun violence? That is the question. I'd just like to make my point very clear and clear. The first word in community safety is community. It's not police and it's not politicians. This current budget decided that we need to invest more in policing and less in community. And historically, it does not work. We have a major problem here. The solution being proposed in this budget is a very lazy, one-dimensional solution to a major critical problem that has multiple dimensions. And community is the first part of it. Toronto has become a city of cities. Your livelihood, your life expectancy, your quality of life depends on where you live, your postal code, and to some extent, the color of your skin, clearly. We need to close the gap between living in Rosedale and living in Rexdale. And investing in policing and not in community is a major concern, not only for the public, but also for the politicians that are decision makers. Robert Peel, who, is, who came up with the policing model in 1800, talks about policing being a relationship, partnerships with community and good relationships with the public. Policing now is working in isolation, in a vacuum, and the public seems to be an afterthought. We need to reverse. We need to get back to the partnership and the relationship with the public. And it means investing in communities. And this budget 
needs to do a better job of doing that. I know my time is up. So I'm just going to leave the floor open for questions. Uh, Thank we you. We need to address the root causes. We all know that. Thank Our you very much, Lori. Okay. Thank you. Are there questions? Yes. Councillor Thompson. Uh, good afternoon, and how are you today? Very good, my friend. Thank you. Um, you had mentioned in your remarks that um, getting the right people in place would, um, at least this is what I thought I heard, so I just wanted to have clarification if I could. You mentioned that getting the right people in place would eliminate uh, gun violence. Can you expand on that, please? We need to be able to deliver the right resources to the right people in the right time and in the right place. We call okay, it the four okay. R's. You're absolutely right. And we're not doing a good job. We're always showing up late. We're always delivering the wrong services at the wrong time to the wrong people. As long as there's a gap in how we deliver those services, gun violence has to happen. It has to happen. There's a violence that will happen. And it's not only gun violence, Mr. Counselor, it's domestic violence. It's drug violence. All these things are happening because we're showing up late, because our budget, which informs our programs, our budget, which informs our policies, our budget that informs our funding models, we need to take another look at it because we're spending the money after the fact when we should be spending it up front. And uh, one thing I'd like to mention, if I can, is if you would deal with the root causes of gun violence, there's multiple benefits to the city in many other areas. There's multiple benefits if we deal with the root causes. If the policing solution is the only solution that comes out of City Hall, then we've missed the boat totally. We all stand to increase safety, less drug addiction, more employment, better educational entertainment. Those are the benefits that we all derive as a city if we invest in community and deal with the root causes. Thank you very much for that, Luis. Uh, can you tell me, um, is there a model city that we should be looking at replicating some of the work that's being done in terms of addressing the issue around gun violence? Is there a model city, U.S., globally? To answer that question, Councillor, there is not a model city. There's a model city for one year, two years. You know, we can go to Europe, we can go to Scotland, we can, we can look at what happened. But it's not being able to maintain, sustain, sorry, the improvements. So we can do something and we can see it working for one year, two years in maybe Oakland, in Baltimore, in Detroit and so on. But it's not sustainable because it's still not the right model. Okay, thank you very this much. Is, we need oh. a made in Toronto solution. We need a made in Toronto solution. And we have to realize that we have to be bold and courageous in creating that model. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councillor Myers. Thank you, Louis, for coming to present to us today. Um, just for my clarification, how long have you been working towards ending gun violence in Toronto? I'm a corporate manager by profession. I'm retired. I've been working in the community with young people since the 1970s. My mentor was Dudley Laws. Uh, he advised me many years ago that nobody's born with a gun in their hand. Understand why and the pathway to, for that gun to be in his hand, and then you can deal with the problem. And we've always focused on policing. So in terms of my time in the community, we started Zero Gun Violence Movement in 2013 with seven community organizations. Councillor, it was supposed to be a 60-day summer initiative. We were going to go around the city, identify what the causes of gun violence was, and tackle the problem. In 60 days, we figured that. But guess what? Ten years later, we're still at it. Because as we peel the layers off one by one, we were realizing that it's more difficult and more complex, more complicated than we originally thought. So what started off 10 years ago as a, a 90 day, sorry, some, uh, summer campaign has now turned into a 10 year uh, adventure. Thank you. Um, 
So you've been working towards ending gun violence from the 1970s and you've founded Zero Gun Violence Movement 10 years ago. Just, you know, for just to put this on the record, do you consider yourself an expert in this field of ending gun violence? Or you have an expertise that you've gained through, you know, years of advocacy and community work? There's an expertise that I've gathered, but we are a network of several uh, people with, that bring different resources, perspectives, whether it's academics, whether it's youth workers. We have a network of people that work with us, that provide us with insight. We also work with the mothers who have lost children to gun violence. We also work with the people that are responsible for the violence. People who have done the crime, done the time, and want to make a difference. Half of the population that we work with have criminal records. So our perspective on the gun violence issue, where it started, where were the intervention points, what were missed, we have a good understanding of that. Uh, so in terms of an expert, I'm not sure how you, you know, <laughs> describe an expert, but we have insights that maybe the politicians and maybe the police would not have. Great. So your organization has various expertise and insights that um, you've gained through the accumulation of knowledge by the various people that are involved. Exactly. Okay, great. What is the biggest gap that you have identified in our budget in dealing with gun violence or even violence more generally that your organization, through its expertise and insight, has known to be proven to lower violence that we are currently not doing in this budget? Like, I think to, to answer that question, I would say is that we've invested resources, whether it's physical resources, buildings, whether it's people resources, whether it's workers, whether it's resources, whether it's funding, we've invested them in the wrong areas. Uh, we have community organizations that work from nine to five, and they do programming from nine to five. But the population that is involved in criminal activity, their hours of work are 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Total disconnect. Uh, we, we, we need to show up on time. We need to make our services and resources available to the population more likely to be involved in criminal activity. Even giving them jobs is not working these days because that's not, they're not prepared for to be employed. So the hustle becomes their main source of income, but in doing that, violence is part of it. We need to get to these, this population early. That means in elementary school, we have to have community services that are available beyond the nine to five model. And then we have to provide the, the support, the wraparound support some community organizations are doing what they cannot do by themselves. They have to be wraparound where you look after the housing people and you look after the drug addiction people. You look after the mental health people. We don't have that collaborative approach. It's very individualistic, very ice in, in, in uh, silos. We don't have the coordination and the collaboration among the, the services that the city funds. Thank you, Louis. Thank you very much for your deputation. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Councillor Moise has a question. Oh, I hope we didn't leave. Did he? Okay. I do apologize. That's okay. He's still there. Are you still here? Oh, oh there we are. Okay, we had a question from uh, uh, Councillor Moise. Uh, thank you for your uh, deputation. Um, so again, gun violence in Canada seems to be on the rise. Um, unlike Australia and New Zealand, you know, we're not an island. We have a, the largest, largest border in, in the world with the US. And of course, as you know, there's been an increase in gun violence among young people, um, more specifically here in Scarborough, as we all aware. Um, and I've had many discussions with the school board and the police and the city around some of the initiatives that we can do to probably try to mitigate that downwards. What are some strategies you think would work um, we could put in place to, to help deal with some of these issues with the young, uh, with the gun violence among young people? 
We need to go back to the roots of violence report, youth violence report that uh, was done in 2008. We have to look at the social economic situations that need to be addressed. The mayor of Toronto did a report called to action that was released in 2008 that clearly outlines the problem that was going on. His solution was pro-policing from top to bottom. We have to find a different approach, Mr. Councillor. We have to find a different approach. What needs to be done is, instead of talking about banning handguns, let's talk about banning poverty. That's a mindset shift that will give us multiple benefits that we have not gone down that route. Talk about banning poverty instead of banning handguns. And I say that seriously because 95% of the guns found at crime scene are illegal guns smuggled across the border. We have the largest border with the largest manufacturer and producer of guns in the world. We have to do a better job at working with border security, American security, to prevent the guns from coming in. I'm not suggesting that we build a wall between Canada and America, okay, to stop the guns from coming in. But there's other things that we can do and focus in those areas. And then also we've got to give our young people, our youth, opportunity access to resources on a timely basis. We know what's going on in Rosedale. We know what's going on in Rexdale. Why can't we close the gap? Why can't we do that? Everybody has that right to feel safe. Everybody has that right to be able to leave their house and come home knowing that their children will be safe. And that's why I go back to the school. Okay, I'm gonna tell you straight up. The gun violence numbers in the city of Toronto over the last two years have really declined. 2021 to 2022, the amount of shootings declined 7.4%. Uh, the amount of homicides declined. Maybe we're starting to see a shift. I can't say it's a trend yet, but over the last years, we have seen a decline, okay? So to continue to focus on policing and not continue to invest in communities, I'm not talking about the typical investment. There has to be ma massive investment. At the school level, the elementary school students will tell me who is involved in criminal activity at the elementary school level. If the students know that, you mean to say we as, as political leaders do not know it? So that's how I would answer it. Uh, we have to do a better job early. Our service hours have to change. They have to, we have to remodel that. Hmm. And then we have to actually engage that population that is on the edge, that is asking for help, but we show up late. Yeah. Well, social determinants of health is a factor, of course, when it comes to crime. There's a, there's a correlation there. But one of the other pieces that add to that is uh, social isolation when it comes to young people. Because for me, growing up here in this, in this city, versus a young person growing up now is very different. You know, everything is paved over, everything's private property. You know, kids don't have uh, the same freedom as, as I did growing up. If, they're going, if they go into the mall, they're trespassing. If they go into the community center, well, there's certain hours they could do that. So again, those are things, I, I'm supposed to ask you a question. <laughs> I was about to mention, we got Would about, you, agree you, you have about 10 seconds. <laughs> You have to have a quick answer. Do you the believe way. there's a, a difference between now and then, something like that? <laughs> Fifteen seconds or less. Okay, to answer it quickly, to Council Carpenter, to answer it quickly. Uh, I was with a group of men, over twenty men, sitting down talking freely about the trib the tribal the trials and tribulations that they're experiencing, like. and social isolation. Council was one of the main things they spoke about: mm -hmm. the lack of access to timely resources and supports and also uh, the fact that they, they, they can't go to places, they can't go to the mall, they can't go to the library, right? Uh, so we know what the problem is. We just need some political leadership will encourage to get, to get there early and not late. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. The next, thank you very Thanks much, uh, Louis.
The next two speakers, we have Tai Dillon and Li Zhao, both from the Scarborough Campus Students' Union. They're going to be speaking, I guess, together with us. Tai, are you with us? I am. And great. Li is there, so you have combined 10 minutes between the two of you. You can determine who wants to speak more or less on the, uh, the time. All right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tai Dillon Higashihara, and I'm the Vice President External for the Scarborough Campus Students' Union. And I'm active community member uh, at Scarborough Rouge Park, and I am currently residing in the Danforth area. I'd like to thank you for giving me the time to speak today. The University of Toronto Scarborough um, has around 17,000 students, most of whom are commuters. Uh, more than 70% utilize public transit to get to campus. Amongst the tri-campus, Scarborough campus is also the campus with the largest um, number of students accessing OSAP. We know through the university's own research that the number of students who struggle, um, there are a number of students who struggle paying for public transit. This adversely affects the attending, attending classes and their right to access education more broadly. Today, I'm speaking here today about the recent fare increase. The increase in TTC fares of 10 cents will further make accessing education that much harder for students already burdened with a cost of living crisis, especially in light of inflation and the looming recession. Fair in this fare increase will prevent the most vulnerable from achieving their academic aspirations. This is unacceptable. Students have for too long been priced out of higher education. This, fee uh, this fare increase is another example of an increasing precarity that young people face in this city. This fare increase is not only counterproductive to increasing ridership, it will also reinforce existing financial barriers to accessing education and will lead to an unsustainable city. Post-secondary uh, post students will also be impacted by fare increases on adult fares because there is no single fare discount for post-secondary students. Many cannot afford to pay the upfront costs of a monthly pass. Not only should fare increases be reversed, but now is the time for TTC to in um, introduce fare capping, which means you would ride for free after you tap enough of a single fare to cover the cost of a monthly pass. I urge you to reverse this fare increase, which would make higher education um, more, for most, the most vulnerable um, unattainable, worsening the existing socio and economic divide facing many Torontonians. Higher education is a right and must be free of all barriers to access it. Such an increase in fares unfairly puts the burden on the very marginal members of our community. City Council had ample time to look for alternative funding and knew about the existing budget shortfall. On behalf of the University's Toronto Scarborough students, I urge the city to seek for provincial and federal funding in addition for alternative funding sources such as commercial parking lot levies on big malls and commercial landlords providing funding. As you all may very well know, according to the Toronto Environmental uh, Alliance and the City of Toronto's own reports, a parking levy of $6.25 an hour would add up to $575 million a year for the TTC. Alternative funding like commercial parking levies have been introduced by other large cities like New York, Chicago, Montreal, and Vancouver. Toronto needs to fall su follow suit. This kind of funding cut would, uh, would also allow for cuts in uh, transit fares, improve service, and offer a al greener alternative. We need lower fares. We need frequent transit. And we need more reliable service in order to increase ridership and alleviate the budget shortfall, ultimately making public transit and education accessible to all. All students, including myself, 
want to live in a city that's sustainable and works for all, not just those who can afford to live here. Thank you. Was Lee also going to speak, or is that after? We'll do questions of the two of you after then. Okay, perfect. So hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Lee, and I'm a graduate student attending the University of Toronto studying history with a specialization in immigration. Um, I'm also staff for the Scarborough Campus Students Union as the campaigns and advocacy coordinator. Uh, I grew up in Don Valley West, and for most of my life, I've been riding the TTC, whether it be attending classes, working, or visiting family and friends. While I currently live in Parkdale High Park, I work in Scarborough Rouge Park and attend classes in University Rosedale. My commute from home to my job approximates an hour and a half on a good day, which is already an extraordinarily long commute. It's also incredibly difficult to get from the downtown U of T St. George campus to the U of T Scarborough campus. I know so many students who commute between those campuses trying to make it to their classes and TA ships and RA ships. This also includes U of T Mississauga as well. These impending service cuts mean being late for work and for class. It also means more time waiting in the cold. Cuts to off-peak service will affect shift workers, women, low-income and racialized riders the most. Those are who travel more outside of rush hour. We also see the increase of policing on our TTC disproportionately affecting those who are low income and racialized as well. With the additional 10 cent fare increase, this means we'll be paying more for less service. As a student in Ontario, we are already paying the second highest tuition fees in Canada. So many students cannot afford the upfront cost of a monthly pass as my, uh, as my <laughs> friend and associate uh, Ty has just mentioned. With the high cost of living, rent and food inflation, students are being priced out of the city. This also disproportionately affects international students who pay up to four to six times more in tuition fees than domestic students. I urge everyone to reverse this fare increase. If anything, as Ty has already mentioned, we need fare capping, meaning free rides after tapping enough single fares to cover the cost of a monthly pass. We also need to look at alternative sources of funding. A fare increase will only generate 16 million. In contrast, the TTC's COVID impact shortfall in 2023 was 366 million. What we need is a commercial parking levy, a tax that can be applied to non-residential commercial parking lots. This doesn't mean driveways or residential lots. This is a real and bold solution to our current budget crisis. If implemented in 2018, Mayor John Tory could have unlocked up to 2.875 billion over the last five years. In 2020, city councilors voted to study this commercial parking levy tool, but we did not see a report. We need a staff report now to look at how we can implement this. If we do not look at alternative revenue sources and simply increase fares and decrease service, people will be driven away from the TTC and ridership numbers will fall. I urge all of you to stop the service cuts, reverse the fare increase and look at real funding solutions. I love Toronto. I spent most of my life here and I and many other students and community members do not want to be priced out of a city that we love and hold close to our heart. Thank you for your time. Uh, Councillor Moyes has some questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, you said something about the TTC um, fare cap that, that, I, that intrigued me. Um, I know that New York has changed their model. They have a weekly um, fare pass in the sense that after you tap up to 14 times, it's free for the remainder of the week. Um, and it's worked very well. Uh, it's actually a new app on your phone, so you could tap it as you enter the transit system. You could also use it for... Um, other things. They have similar things in Asia, actually. Um, what are your thoughts around that? Would that be a good alternative to the current system? Um, I mean, any um, fare capping system would be beneficial for those who are writing, especially um, low income uh, individuals who, who struggle paying upfront costs of the monthly pass. Um, especially students, because student monthly pass compared in comparison to the regular monthly pass isn't a large difference, and that might um, pull into cost savings. 
Um, it's funny that you mentioned New York because I actually was just in New York about two weeks ago and then that system is really, I think, really beneficial. Um, I think, especially any, as Ty was saying, I think any fair capping system is a step in the right direction. But I think at the end of the day, we're also looking for real and bold alternative funding solutions. So I think fair capping is like a step in the right direction. Um, but I think, again, uh, we can see that the TTC's budget for shortfall is quite large and we need to look at different revenues and that looks like a commercial parking lot levy. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. But um, one of the objectives, I think, is that is to get people back on the transit system. And we need to find, well, do you believe we should find bold ways to uh, make that happen? I think perhaps something like the New York model will work here in Toronto. And what is the objective? What, what do you think the objective should be? To get people back on transit? Because right now, the projection is we expect 75% of ridership pre-pandemic as for 2023. As of today, it's at 69%. So there's 31% of people who are not using transit, but perhaps are in their cars. So do you believe that, and that's a long-winded question, do you think that um, by having bold initiatives like this, uh, as I've just mentioned and you've alluded to, would that help bring people back onto the transit system? Um, ultimately, we do need a reduction in fares. We need more reliable service and f more frequent service. Those three things would increase public transit use. Without that, you would see more people opting to drive their cars. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think... Um, uh as, as someone who sometimes drives as well, I think the point of uh, the TTC is that like it's always we want publicly funded transit, and I think we don't want the reliance on cars to be what we see forever. And I think like it depends in certain areas on where you're, whether you're from the suburbs or from your like a northern or rural area. I think it depends on your reliance on a car. But I think the ultimate uh, end goal for transportation is public funded public transport, and I think that's why, as Ty was saying. The only way to increase ridership is to decrease uh, the fares and to increase the service. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you both for coming. Next three speakers are Patrick Kalia, Jamal Chapman, and Sheila Pizzi Allen, or Pizzi Allen. Patrick, are you there? I think you're online. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thanks for coming. You have five minutes. Hi, my name is Patrick Elijah from the Spadina for York Ward. I'm here to talk about the TTC budget and urge you not to cut budget or services. This issue matters to me because transit plays an important role in my life. One of my earliest experience of independence was with transit, where I stayed back after science class to work on a group project. I can imagine the same feeling for other kids who discovered this service, which opens the door for them to experience what the city has to offer. Before living here, I heard about how amazing the transit was. My friends would gloat how sometimes they only have to wait five minutes for the next bus. And they, they were right to brag. Around that time, there were significant contributions in public transportation. It became cleaner, punctual, more services available, and underwent rebranding from a utility to what it really is, a critical part of Torontonians' everyday lives. And they even won 2017 Transit System of the Year Award from the American Public Transportation Association. You can imagine how excited I was when I moved to Toronto. I can't say the same about the transit system. Here are some of my experiences. Going home from Ronthi, there's so many short turns. I remember waiting on King, King on Shaw for more than half an hour, and sometimes I end up walking home. I recall taking the bus home after basketball practice. The bus never showed up three times after saying it'll be here in the next 10 minutes respectively, while I waited outside in the cold. I'm grateful to be able to call an Uber for these frequent moments. That day when I got into Uber, I saw someone else walking to the stop. I wonder how long did she wait and how did she get home? I remember taking the Jane bus, which is usually crowded. This time it showed up late and could only take so many. Again, I had to call an Uber. So many shift workers use this bus. I can't imagine how much more crowded it will get after service cuts. These proposed budget and service cuts are a step in the wrong direction. 
please continue to expand and invest in transportation. For example, automatic train control is, is amazing and increases service time. I've experienced it myself. I just missed the train and the next one showed up right away. But now you want to cut this to a 10 minute wait? Transit allows access to jobs and economic opportunities for the low income. But without funding, many low income riders will not qualify for this kind of first. Please consider using commercial parking levies, which is a great funding tool that can generate uh, anywhere from 100 to 500 million. Just like the president's set from leadership that resulted in the 2017 Transit System of the Year, what presidents will this current leadership make for future Torontonians and for others who look up to our city? Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for coming. Next is Jamal Chapman. Welcome, Jamal. Good afternoon. All right, good afternoon, Budget Committee. My name is Jamel Chapman. I was born and raised in Scarborough, and now I'm raising my own little family here. As an active member of the community, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the speak on the budget for this year. I'm also one of the vice presidents from Centennial College Student Association, a nonprofit organization representing 22,000 students in Toronto, and three of our campuses reside in Scarborough. Today, I'm here to talk to you about the impact of the proposed TTC service cuts and increase in fare to students and my own family. This issue is personally personal to me because my wife, my sister, they frequently take the TTC to travel to and from work and to school. Their safety is a priority of mine. Public transportation should be safe a safe option for community members, but there are frequent instances where individuals find themselves in crisis with no support for de-escalation, wayfinding, and accessibility services. Service cuts further exasperate this issue. This allows for the overcrowding of buses, streetcars, and subways. One could imagine how that might be a recipe for disaster when an individual in crisis finds themselves in this situation. With the cuts in services, students are going to have to wait longer for transit, which can be unsafe for students coming home from late night classes. I know some of my classes uh, lasted until 10.30 to 11 o'clock, maybe a little later if they go over time. And this is especially dangerous for uh, female students, uh, students with disabilities. And this is all gonna be taking place while fares are going to increase. On top of that, in Scarborough, students are already going to have to make, ter uh, make terms with the closure of the Scarborough SRT line uh, later on this year. As students rely on it, not only for students, but also for not only for school, but also for getting to and from part-time jobs and connecting with other services. This rapid transit line is going to be replaced with the shuttle bus service for at least the next 10 years while the new line is being built. And this is not the time to be making cuts to transit. Uh, you've already iterated that you want more ridership, and this kind of kind of goes against that. Students and transit riders, like my family, will be paying more for less. We recognize that the TTC is in a deficit, but increasing fares is not the right solution. We are asking the city council to consider other forms of revenue. My deputants today earlier, uh, my peers and deputants today earlier, uh, talked about other ways of revenue. Uh, cities around the world are implementing commercial parking levies successfully. In Toronto, we could have raised nearly $3 billion in the last five years if we had implemented it uh, earlier on. I urge you to expand your efforts towards creating a safe and dignified TTC service by ensuring reliable service levels, find sustainable resources for funding. We need to invest in transit now to ensure Toronto, and especially Scarborough, is accessible and safe place for students and residents today and for our children tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Thompson had a question. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chapman, for being here. Um, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned that um, there'll be, um, you, you termed it as a shuttle service for the next 10 years to replace the SRT. Are you aware that that's not factually correct? I was not. What is replacing the SRT? Thank you for the question. I don't normally answer the question, but it gives me an opportunity to do so. But Sorry. there will be shuttle bus services, but the service is intended to be in place for about 18 months to two years, not 10 years. It'll actually be the corridor is going to be used as a bus uh, BRT, bus rapid transit, going to the Scarborough Town Center. Oh, Are you aware of that? <laughs> No. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I think there's a need for more information, and more information will be coming forward. The TTC obviously is working on that. I'm the local counselor in the bulk of that area, so we are being provided with some information, and that's coming forward. So I think we need to provide more clarity. Uh, but my question to you then, if that clarity was provided to you, would you feel a little bit better? Because of obviously waiting for 10 years just using the bus services in that manner, whether or not it's going down, because it's going to be going north on Kennedy Road, south on Midland. That's how it's going to be dispersed in terms of the traffic. And it's more or less looking at dedicated um, bus right away and so on, and of course signalizing to in terms of moving the, vehicle, the traffic and so on. Um, I, I'm just curious as to whether or not knowing that information, that helps you to alleviate some of the challenges or concerns that you may have had regarding a 10-year uh, challenge of utilizing buses in that manner? Um, to be honest, a little. Yeah. But uh, I would also say that uh, on Midland, I mean, on Midland and on Kingston. Kennedy. Oh, Kennedy, sorry. Yeah. That's cool. I'm not sure on Kennedy, but I know on Midland for sure there are no uh, bus lanes available right now. Um, Nor on Kennedy. At the, moment. Kennedy. At the moment, um, I, it's been a while since I had to take the TC myself, but mm -hmm. my, my wife, my sister, a lot of my family members take it often and they reiterate, you know, uh, even with the bus lanes, it's still a, a, a struggle to get Challenge. to and from uh, where they need to go. It's not really a lot of uh, fast, uh, accessible uh, uh, TC services to other parts of uh, the further sure. further east that you go yeah. in Scarborough. So that's one thing that's really on my mind. Um, also, with the service cuts, it kind of creates anxiety sure. because the problems that we already had pre-pandemic are going to be exasperated yeah. uh, with, with this. Uh, people who relied on the SRT are going to have to, you know, uh, yeah. shift the, how they move uh, to get around the city. So I believe that um, having your ear uh, closer to the ground, trying to meet those needs on a, a, a more uh, grounded level would alleviate some of the stress for the community. Gotcha. Uh, personally, me. Um, uh, knowing that my, my wife is out there late at night, she's trying to get back home, knowing that there's regular service, there's somebody around keeping an eye, some, 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 uh, natural surveillance, that'd be great. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to uh, make suggestions at this time. Okay. Yeah, we are, we're all ears. Yes. Okay. So, um, I, uh, recently was in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I spent a couple months there, uh, visiting my, uh, in-laws. Um, what they have are, are uh, community members who are stationary uh, uh, observers of, of things that happen in the com uh, community. Uh, they are they have frequent uh, they have quick access to the police and other services. So they're stationary. They have their booths and they're just watching what's going around. And late in the night, you know, it's a very dangerous uh, city on Sao Paulo. Uh, you, you can imagine that having that stationary surveillance is very comforting for uh, women who are coming back uh, from uh, the middle of the city, back to favelas or back to the communities outside. So something like that, um, I know that I was looking at the budget this morning, uh, you were creating salaries for 50 new constables to uh, aid in the TTC transport. Um, great, but also maybe some non-police uh, members, members who are trained in de-escalation, who are not armed, uh, members who are more, who present less, how do you say, when they show up, is they present less anxiety yeah. for uh, uh, Torontonians who feel that uh, anxiousness when the police show up. Um, so something like that. Um, I, I don't know if you... you yeah, no, thank you very much for that. I mean, there are also outreach workers that are being incorporated into the budget. So it's not just simply about policing. I think there are about 10 of, 10 of those for mental 
Then street, street to, yeah, ten. Street to home. There are ten of those for street to homes. Okay, I hope those uh, are and present in Scarborough. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. Much Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councillor Myers has a question. Yes. Uh, just a clarification. Are you speaking on behalf of yourself or as the Centennial Students Association or both? Both. Um, when I say that uh, students need more accessible and safe uh, TTC uh, uh, services, they don't uh, desire a cut uh, in TTC services. They need it to be at what it was, if not more. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of both my, my, uh, myself personally and for the uh, Centennial College Student Association and for the students that we represent. Um, the suggestion that I made to the counselor, that was personal. That was a personal okay. suggestion. Great. Um, and I just want to clarify, has the Centennial Students Association taken any position on in terms of what type of replacement service they would like to see for the SRT in the interim until the um, the dedicated route is built along the SRT route? So, for example, on Kennedy, Midland, and Ellesmere, are they advocating for dedicated lanes or just, just want to clarify? Dedicated lanes for the... For the, the buses bus that are going to replace well, the SRT. Um, going up Morningside, there's already, uh, and, and Kingston mm -hmm. Road, there's already uh, designated bus routes, and those help a lot. You know, um, they alleviate uh, the traffic that uh, people who would take the buses would feel uh, during rush hours and stuff like that. Uh, so they do, are, we are really appreciative of that, of course. Um, I know that it's a space issue, you know, a whole lane dedicated to uh, buses is a, is, a, is, a, is a problem, you know. Personally, I drive, but my wife, my my, my sister, uh, you know, they don't drive, so uh, they, they rely on it. And, you know, for me, knowing that they can get to where they need to go safely and on time is, is a relief, you know. Um, when I can, I drive them, but when I can't, they take the bus. And having that service there, knowing that it's reliable, knowing that it's not going to decrease so that I have to worry about them waiting at a bus stop late in the night or something like that, uh, it puts me at ease. I mean, it helps me to sleep, sleep better. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. just to clarify, uh, having a dedicated bus lane for the replacement service would, as you as a citizen, would make you feel better, and that would be supported by the Centennial Students Association until we sort of build a dedicated bus lane. We haven't had a official discussion on that. Okay. There, we obviously talk. Um, we we talk and we conversate about it, and um, there are. We are still ironing that out. What, what we what we would prioritize, but the. The feeling that I get is that the bus leads have helped all students across uh, uh, Scarborough and I assume the uh, downtown area. Um, getting, get, just getting from Kingston Road to Morningside, that can be uh, congested at uh, you know five o'clock, four o'clock in the evening, and just getting on it, knowing you're going to reach your class on time, it's just a load off your off your mind. So yes, that type of uh, intervention has helped. Great, thank you, Mr. Chapman. All right. Thank you very much for coming out. Appreciate it. Next is Sheila Paisi Allen. Yeah. Welcome. Hello. Five minutes. Thanks for the chance to speak to you today. My name is Sheila Paisi Allen. I'm speaking here on behalf of TTC Riders, a membership-based group of transit users in Toronto. And I'm here, I'm gonna be echoing some of what you've heard today from transit users. I'm here to urge you to stop the service cuts, stop the fare increases, and fund the TTC with tools at your disposal, like a commercial parking levy on big malls and commercial landlords. Cuts, Fare increases is only going to drive more transit users away. You've heard it today, and you don't need to take my word for it. It's not my personal opinion. It's something that experts are saying today in the Toronto Star. Professor Stephen Farber wrote about this and the impact. After the TTC cut service in the 90s, it took the better part of a decade to win riders back. And we don't have a decade when it comes to our climate goals. Our Transform TO plan includes a move towards free transit, a huge boost in service, and this budget takes us in the wrong direction. So briefly, I want to share about, you know, who cuts and fare increases are going to impact in our city and why we're asking you to fully fund the fare pass low income discount program as a step towards free and accessible public transit, you know, which is part of the, TTC, uh, the city's climate goals. Service cuts mean being late for work, 
They mean more crowded buses. They mean waiting longer. And as we've heard, that's longer wait times on top of the extra time that you'll be waiting um, and taking the bus when the Scarborough RT shuts down this fall. You know, it is just a two year, I won't get into all the details of that, but um, I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, in terms of who this impacts, um, we're talking about people with disabilities. So um, changing the crowding standard, more crowding during the off-peak periods and standing, planning for standing room only means no room to get on with your wheelchair, no room to get on with your stroller and your grocery carts. Um, and it's very concerning because there is a policy change coming to Wheeltrans that is going to shift people off of full door-to-door -door Wheeltrans service into taking the conventional TTC for part of their trips. And so if people can't get on the bus, that means more isolation, less access to our city. This is going to have impacts on shift workers. This is, according to TTC data, one of the largest groups of TTC users right now are shift workers. And this budget cuts service exactly when they are t using the service during the afternoon, in the very early morning, in the evening. This budget will impact racialized people. You know, the TTC data shows that black and indigenous people are grossly misrepresented in enforcement actions. Um, and so we, we are calling for an investment in supportive staff. We have heard about the investment in streets to homes workers, but we have questions about, you know, where's, this, where's the investment in something like the, the TCCS, you know, people that are trained in crisis intervention. When people see um, others on the subway in mental and emotional distress, they want them to um, receive support. We aren't seeing enough investment in that in this budget. Um, um, the last you know, kind of group of people I want to talk about are people living under the poverty line, low-income people in our city. Fare increases means less money in their pockets for food, and there are people who cannot afford to make it to a food bank because of the high cost of public transit. And that's why we're calling on you to fully fund the Fair Pass program. This is part of the poverty reduction strategy. It was adopted in 2016. It was supposed to be fully expanded in 2020, and now it's years behind. And I want to clear up a misunderstanding because there has been a, you know, um, an announcement that this will become eligible, you know, 50,000 people become eligible. But then when you read the briefing note from the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office, it's clear only eight to 12,000 people will actually benefit. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if next year we see that less people have benefited because there are no resources in this budget to promote the fair pass. It's not a deep enough discount. It's hard to apply for. Most people don't know it exists. The income cutoff is, is so low and most people you know, don't know where they fall. Um, and sometimes it feels like the whole fair pass discount has really been set up to fail, to have a low uptake so that it won't cost the city much. Right now, last year we saw an 18% take up you know, of people who are eligible, only 18% were using the fair pass. And there's basically been a, a cut. Um, you know, $3.6 million is being saved because it's, it's not being expanded um, to more people. And I just want to close. Um, I'm kind of running out of time. I wanted to share something about safety. It's kind of difficult and emotional, but I think it's very beautiful and important for people to hear. It is a public message from the father of Michelle Alyssa Go. She was murdered a year ago in the New York subway. And her father has written something a few days ago in the New York Times to mark the tragic anniversary. And I'd encourage you to read it in full. Um, and I'm just going to share a, a few lines from it today. He writes that if Michelle, his daughter, were still here, she would urge us to come together to build a safer community. This is not about politics. This is about caring for each other and humanity. Real change comes with meaningful preventive measures. This requires adequate and continued funding for housing, treatment, other programs. We need to have true resolve and, com and continued commitment so that we can honor the spirit of Michelle's life. So I know I'm over time. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Councillor Myers has a question. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Um, just a question. You said that only eight to 12,000 people actually benefit from the fair, fair pass um, out of the 50,000 eligible, is that correct? Yeah, um, yes. And so just to be clear, um, that's the expansion. So $2 million has been provided to expand the program and to a tiny fraction of people who are supposed to be eligible for this next phase. Uh, the other problem with that, with that that we have is that that funding is coming out of the TTC budget, which means it's being paid for by some transit users who are under the poverty line. It, it should be coming out of the Social Development Finance and Administration budget. Um, and the last phase of the fair pass, it would make 200,000 more people eligible um, on top of that for the, for the low-income fair pass discount. 
And the other stat I mentioned that kind of rushed through is that only 18% of people eligible for the fair pass last year used it. And instead of reinvesting the money that was allocated for the fair pass into promoting it, expanding it to more people, that money has been cut. It's called an efficiency in the budget. That's $3.6 million that's not being put into the fair pass this year. So do you have su solutions or suggestions uh, to making sure that we're reaching the other 72% of people who are eligible but are currently not using the fair fair pass? I, I can provide some suggestions. I think this is a good question for the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office and also, you know, the many organizations in Toronto that serve low-income residents. So some of the barriers we've heard about, folks, we, we do help people sign up for the fair pass are... Number one, people don't know about it. So just you know, resources to make sure there's a campaign so people are aware of this program in multiple languages, in places um, that trans users go, like the TTC. Um, there's also barriers in terms of Presto. So you have to already have a Presto card before you apply. Number one, the $6 barrier. Um, uh, number two, you, know, you can't get a Presto card except at a subway station or a shopper's drug mart. And there's huge gaps right here in Scarborough for you can access Presto. There are some distributed libraries, but, you know, so there's, there's partly the funding issue, but there's just many, many barriers to applying for the program. Great. And do you have any sense as to what the changes to Wheeltrans would do for riders who currently have disabilities or for seniors in terms of being able to... Uh, fit their wheelchairs or uh, seniors being able to actually physically get on the bus? Yeah, so the, it's this is a program called the Family of Services, and the TT, it's, part of the TT, um, it's part of a TTC plan, and it would screen out up to 50% of current wheel trans users from full door-to-door -door service. Um, I, I can go into, you know, I'm happy to follow up with you in more detail because there are some technicalities about the different categories of access, but what it basically boils down to is less access, you know, more isolation at home. Uh, people um, being, you know, part, what, the idea is that instead of getting picked up at your door from a wheel trans vehicle and dropped off, you might get picked up and then dumped on the side of the road and wait for the bus to come along and you just hope there's enough space to get on. And if you can't get on, you have to wait for the next bus. That's the policy. They won't just come and pick you up on demand. That's not how it's set up. So we have very serious concerns about how um, not only the Family of Services program in general, but these service cuts are going to result in less space on buses, streetcars, and subways, which will um, dramatically impact uh, people with disabilities' access to public transit. And uh, how did you come up with that figure of 50%? That's in the TTC's um, re reports. I'm happy to send. That's, um, that's their internal target for diverting people from full door-to-door -door service or what they call unconditional service. So just to uh, be, state this clearly, the TTC is changing the wheel trans program deliberately so that 50% of the people that are currently using wheel trans will no longer be eligible for the service. This is where it gets a bit technical. So it's up to 50%. That's their diversion target. And part of the, the reason this is happening is that under the AODA, more people are going to become eligible for, TT, uh, for wheel trans in 2025. That's, that's a great thing. But funding to expand wheel trans service has not been expanded. And so what's happening is that some people are being screened out from full door-to-door -door service and they're um, given conditional access, which means under some conditions, let's say during the daytime, you're going to be dropped off at the side of the road. So it's quite complicated and I'm, I'm happy to provide more information later. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for your deputation. Members, just want to give you a time. Uh, we have about 12 more people that we have to see. That will put us probably, we'll definitely have to extend after 4.30, looking at probably about 5 o'clock. So anybody who is on uh, online or in person, we will be going beyond 4.30. I'm hoping to get done by 5. Uh, and recognizing that we do need to let staff have some time off before the 6 p.m. So if you can just recognize that in the questions that you're asking, just try to be balanced in your questions so we can try to get done at a reasonable time to give everyone a bit of a break before the evening session. Next three are Chris Langenfield, Anna Niminen, and Pablo Escobar. Welcome, Chris.
Thank you, Chair Crawford and uh, counselors. Um, I uh, actually emailed you, uh, uh, most of what I'm going to speak about is um, in terms of the uh, police budget and how that can be uh, better spent, this increase. And so I did email uh, both the three of you individuals and to the budget committee uh, some of the sources for these numbers. Uh, I would also be happy to make some comments on the TTC. We'll see if I have time. Um, but looking at a, uh, a Numbio.com survey, uh, Part of the, um, the basis for the police uh, budget increase was the number of officers versus uh, per capita population. And they were comparing uh, Chicago to Toronto. Uh, however, when you look at the uh, basis, although Chicago has many more officers, uh, looking at this Numbio survey uh, crime comparison where Chicago rates high at a 78, whereas Toronto rates immediate, uh, moderate at a 46. So Toronto, uh, Chicago actually reports 69% higher crime rates despite having many more police officers. Um, Toronto in that survey only rated high in terms of quote, crime increasing in the past three years. And I think we can see that uh, um, that hasn't translated or been equated with reduced policing. Um, in all other categories, Toronto's crime in comparison to Chicago's, Chicago's was high, whereas Toronto was moderate or low. Uh, in a 2010 Toronto Star report, um, they reported 458 Chicago homicides compared to Toronto's 61 for the 2009 year. Um, we rate higher elsewhere on safety more than anything else when compared to Chicago. And uh, in looking at a uh, 2012 uh, Global News report, which I emailed uh, to is in that email to you, um, San Diego has uh, half our per capita uh, crime rate here uh, compared to Toronto. Uh, it's only in uh, homicides that they're 58, or sorry, 57 percent higher in homicides. But of course, that's in uh, gun-friendly USA, so it's not that much of a surprise. Um, but they're. Uh, the rest of their crime is half what uh, Toronto's is for violent crime, and yet they have almost the identical per capita police uh, ratio that we have. So the argument that we should be increasing the number of police officers um, simply isn't supported by the facts. Uh, there's no end of reports that uh, bear that out, and this is true in, in these sets of facts that I've uh, provided for you. Also, we have to look at um, the reality that Toronto has uh, a large uh, proportion of um, non-police officers, non-uniformed officers that are civilian members. So whether those are special constables, uh, there's over 700 special constables that are part of the police budget uh, that are involved in policing but not counted in these numbers. Uh, as well, there are uh, all the special constables that are TCHC, TTC and traffic agents that are uh, assigned to the housing, transportation and, uh, and transit budgets, not to the policing budget. So uh, essentially I would suggest that this 58 million or $48 million, almost $50 million uh, of increased programs uh, to give them alternatives. When you look at the police budget, um, it reports $133 million of that budget, 12% of the dollar amount, 10% of all uniformed officers assigned relate to crime prevention. And yet the reality is that that $133 million in the police budget for crime prevention isn't preventing crime. Where that money could be used, we could take the increase, the $48 million increase here in the budget and spend that on... Uh, on better programs that will actually reduce crime, um, such as, as I mentioned, uh, programs for housing, youth. Uh, we could take a walk when you talk about housing and we talk about not having enough shelter space. Less than 10 minute walk from here, there is a shelter that's been set up in a warehouse. I'm not a fan of the idea of warehousing homeless people, but at the same time, if the difference is between people being out on the streets and them having some kind of roof over their head and some form of heating, we have lots of alternatives. We have lots of empty space in this city, and we should be using it a lot more efficiently. Like to wrap up, please. Yes, that's uh, that completes my submissions, but I hope maybe you'll ask me some questions on the DTC as well. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions. I appreciate your time here today. Oh, oh sorry, Councilor so, Thompson. Thank had you one. for your presentation. Uh, you, thank you. I had just mentioned that um, 10 minutes away from here, there's a shelter that's 
located in a warehouse. Have you been there? I have not. Okay. Um, That's all I need to it's, do. It's on Progress Road here. It's, I would love yeah, to join Just you, so that you're very clear and those who are listening, it's not a warehouse. It's a really, really purpose-built purpose or design facility that actually has really, really amazing features to it, irrespective of the fact that we have to make shelters. You should take a look at it because I think that the, the thought that it is a warehouse and that expression conveys exactly what it's not. Just to be clear. Thank you. It is a warehouse space um, out of a warehouse complex that was converted, I understand, and I would have been happy to go, but unfortunately during the election, uh, social services said that they weren't going to allow people to canvas in uh, in these uh, shelter areas, so otherwise I would have attended and would you should enjoy make it a point to, it. You should make it a point uh, to visit, I, as opposed to mentioning it the fashion that you are. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Anna Niminen. Anna, I believe, is online. Anna, can you hear me? yes, we can. Go ahead. You have five minutes. Good afternoon. I'm grateful that deputations from the public are still a part of the budget process. I'm here because of support from Progress Toronto. My name is Anna Nieminen, and I am a second generation white settler living in Ward 22 Scarborough Agent Court on Indigenous lands. As the daughter of Finnish immigrants to Canada, I could tell you a story about how my working class parents worked hard to give me and my siblings a good start in life and how I've worked hard myself. You've probably heard similar narratives, but I think we white settlers, particularly those of us with financial privilege, need to reflect more deeply on personal, national, and local history. We need to reckon with historic and ongoing colonial violence, environmental racism, and injustice. And we need to begin to work harder in a different way. That is, learning how to live honorably as relatives on these traditional and treated territories. I'm, I'm here today to advocate for full funding of the commitments made in the Reconciliation Action Plan. I was proud of our city when I witnessed Council's unanimous vote in support of the plan last April. For me, the preparation and adoption of the Reconciliation Action Plan was a signal from our city that we wanted to start doing things in a new, honourable way. But I'm concerned that we may be headed for broken promises with this budget. I've reviewed budget briefing note six, equity impacts of changes in the 2023 tabled operating budget and attachment A. And I think the city needs to increase the scope of the equity responsiveness budgeting process so that staff at the People and Equity Division can comment on how the additional 48.3 million proposed for the Toronto Police Service might impact equity and, and reconciliation. This budget addition is out of scope because it, quote, is not categorized as a new or enhanced investment because, because it is intended to ensure adequate service levels are achieved and maintained, end quote. This seems like a flawed process to me. So there's no comment on whether this huge investment would be negative, positive, or neutral. But my perspective, and the perspective of many others who have disputed here, is that this planned bloating of the Toronto Police Services budget will have negative impacts based on evidence, including that it will direct limited resources away from fully funding reconciliation action plan commitments the Confronting Anti-Black Racism Action Plan, the Poverty Reduction Strategy, the Transform TO Net Zero Strategy, Toronto's Resilience Strategy, et cetera. Last May, when, uh, when uh, Mike Layton was on council and a member of the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee, he presented a letter, potential to review a voluntary property tax contribution to support reconciliation and justice. In June, the AAAC considered this proposal and their decision letter states and recommends, one, City Council direct the City Manager to, as part of the 2023 budget process, develop a dedicated source of revenue to fully implement the Reconciliation Action Plan and present any recommendations to the Aboriginal, Advise, Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee in 2023. In July, the executive executive committee and the City Council um, adopted this recommendation when they considered the item 
revenue source for the reconciliation action plan. I've reviewed the 2023 budget notes for the city manager's office, and I couldn't see a reference to this matter of a dedicated revenue source for the reconciliation action plan. Um, where in the pro uh, budget process will this be considered, I wonder? Um, I saw 1 million for the Climate Action and Resiliency Research Fund, but that money will be um, accessed from 1 million in unused 2020, 20, uh, 2021 funds from the Environment Reserve Fund. Uh, this budget proposal expect is expected to have medium positive equity impact. I saw that the gross 2023 operating budget of the People and Equity Office is 49.5 million, and there is a reduction of 1.6 million with undetermined but possibly negative equity impacts. The gross 2023 operating budget of the Indigenous Affairs Office is only 2.7 million. Under the heading Key Challenges and Risks, these budget notes state, quote, resource limitations may impact progress to improve public engagement training and policy development, gain insights and budget uh, build trust, particularly with Indigenous, Black and equity deserving communities. Let's not set ourselves up for broken promises. I reject this budget. I'm asking you to reject it too. We need a budget that honors our reconciliation action plan and other plans and strategies that take care of all our relations here on these lands especially the most vulnerable among us. Kitos, thank you. Thank you very much. Next is uh, Pablo Escobar. Welcome. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> Hello, great. So dear members of the budget committee, Thank you for the opportunity to provide feedback on the 2013 budget city of Toronto. My name is Pablo Escobar and I'm the manager of housing supports at Dixon Hall Neighborhood Services. And I'm also a member of the Toronto Alliance and Homelessness Systems Barrier Group Working Group. Systems Barrier Working Group. And though I'm a, a, a manager of housing supports, I'm here to speak about the lack of funding for housing access. My deputation will focus on city implemented housing access systems, the challenges that these systems give rise to in housing the chronically homeless and the need for more investment in the 2023 budget for tenant access and support in the housing secretariat's budget. Over the last several years, there have been substantial changes to the Toronto's housing access systems that make it much more difficult for the chronically homeless and the at-risk populations to access housing. These include the migration of the Housing Connections waiting list and the Canada-Ontario Housing Benefit to the fully online system, My Access Housing TO, and the coordinated, housing by, the coordinated access by names list through which the city directs agencies as to who they should house. Today, I'll touch base I'm going to touch on issues related to digital exclusion, but I'm happy to entertain questions related to the coordinated access by names list if I don't have time to touch on it. Though applicants are expected to access the online housing access systems independently, chronically homeless individuals are generally unable to do so. Support responsibilities have therefore been downloaded to community agencies and frontline staff without providing any resources. This online choice-based system works well for many communities, but substantially disenfranchises high needs at risk communities, such as the chronically homeless. Many members of these communities disproportionately lack the skills, the capacity, the stability, or access to resources required to navigate this very complicated system independently. All of my staff have had to be trained by the city on how to support folks, where those folks are supposed to be able to manage this independently. To access these resources, clients are required to have regular access to computers or smartphones, have their own email that they can check regularly, regularly upload documents to remain active on the system, including notice of assessment, ability to check regularly online for vacancies, 
bid on these vacancies have the stability and digital know-how required to manage this system. As an individual's at-risk status increases, their ability to navigate this system decreases. And housing workers have picked up all the duties that I've just spoken to. The city is aware because we've been speaking to this about this to them for since their consultations in 2014 around this system. My housing workers are now having to pretend to be these people. They have to set up an email pretending to be this person and bid for this person and look at that. All of those pieces, they, we don't have time. You know how much stress this is causing on the front line? It's unbelievable. It's not a very sexy topic and it's something that I don't think people are aware of in the city. We don't feel that there's internal discussions happening around this. So some implications of this migration to a fully online housing access system are the following. There's a low uptake of the chronically homeless into the new system that the city's aware of. There's increased stress and burnout on the front line that the city's aware of. City staff are aware of, I'm not sure if council's aware. Demographic changes within subsidized housing will happen to a more stable population as at-risk individuals are excluded. So in conclusion, these systems have slowed down the transition of the chronically homeless from the streets and shelters to permanent subsidized and supported housing while increasing the stress on frontline agencies. To be able to facilitate these city processes, which we want to support the city in doing, housing access supports and community agencies, housing help drop-ins and shelters require a substantial increase in funding. Many of these drop-ins and community agencies have recently lost funding at a time when pressure on the system is increasing exponentially. Given these pressures, $12 million compared to $650 million for housing stability is inadequate. We'll have to wrap up, please. I'm done. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Here we go. Excellent. Thank you very much. Any questions? I do not see please any. Keep the Thank stuff you. in mind. Next three speakers, Noor Kazi, Janice Chan, and Zia Chowdhury. Welcome, Nir. You'll yes. have maximum five Good minutes. afternoon. My name is Noor Muhammad Kazi. Uh, my topics is not... You have to speak many, into the mic. Only, if you can speak into the mic, please. Only one topic, that is empathetic neighborhood concept. The budget we have discussed here, I very minorly I heard it, and I guess this is the main problem is, it's not the Toronto city. Toronto city is the global city. And the, all the global cities of the world are now in crisis. Main crisis, corruption. And this all biggest cities are uh, ruling all over the world. So, but the main problems, I told you, the, the empathetic civilization now declining. The created by the cities, the empathetic civilization. Now, this civilization is going down. Why? That is the corruption is over there everywhere. How can we survive with this big problems? COVID created the fearfulness. Everywhere fearness. People will die. Everybody. We are now, the death is the main concept in our brain. And now frustration everywhere. In the cities, I am a, an immigrant. This city, I am living here eight years before I was in Montreal. 
and my country of origin dhaka city one of the mega city last 20 years it it became a mega city montreal also a very much polite nationalist city and the toronto city becoming flourishing and everywhere the popularity is everywhere it's a calm and quiet and disciplined and very polite people in this city so it is surviving and all over the world the immigrant are coming and the government federal government encourages lots of immigrant and most of the immigrant are in this city so multiculturalism and pluralism and by diversity is the main trend of the this toronto city it is flourishing every day young people now everywhere but joblessness housing problem all problems together how can we survive it only the solution is empathy neighborhood we have no connection everybody isolated no combined any effort no empathy no sympathy nothing we are isolated family life broken down everywhere in the ethnic communities we have seen that everywhere the problem ethnic family life and the overall the management so my proposal is let us start from the city every councillor should have a empathetic the outreach program and like we are the people and you see the technology given uh, given the humanity big opportunity having a good the lasering life coming days the technology yesterday i hear the miami as a mayor given a lecture on wilson center afternoon he has given this very smart cities miami is the smart cities and smartly the mayor of the uh, uh, to our Miami city spoke half an hour. It's very good. And how the technology and engulfing the total society and the children. You have, children to, wrap up. You have to wrap up, please. His, his child also very much upside down and they, he cannot control his son and daughter. So what happened? The, everywhere the chaos and confusion so on that way, only the empathetic Thank you. program should be taken by the councillors in the, in the uh, neighboring level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Janice Chan. I believe you are online, Janice. Welcome. So Janice actually is not connected. Next is Zia Chowdhury. Actually, can I just, uh, I'm just noticing time, I just need a quick motion to extend to finish these speakers. Councilor Thompson will move, all in favor, opposed, that's carried. Great, thanks. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Zia Chaudhary, and thanks for arranging this Toronto budget meetings. My concern is regarding to Scarborough, whole Scarborough. So Scarborough population is approximate uh, 629,941, and dwellings are around uh, 228,939. Uh, most of the revenues collected from Scarborough are used in downtown Toronto. There are less job opportunities in Scarborough. So people from Scarborough commute to downtown Toronto. So my concern is how much revenue 
is collected in Scarborough and what is the spending distribution. So if we have any data, I want to see that one. And how much of it is used within Scarborough itself and on which projects. And what plants are in pipeline for creating more jobs within Scarborough so it will avoid people to waste the commute, commute times and go early in the house. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next three speakers are Mike Dodgson, Jess Tomas, and Rosalind Common. Okay, so Mike has withdrawn, so we'll remove that. Next is Jess Tomas. I believe, Jeff, you're on video conference. Folks, can you hear me? We can. Thank you for coming. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. You have Perfect. five. Go ahead. Okay. So my name is Jess Tomas, and I have been an RECE in Toronto for uh, over 12 years. I belong to QP2484, Toronto Child Care Workers, and I'm a community organizer for the Association of Early Childhood Educators of Ontario. Members of my local work at centres in Scarborough, and many live there as well. We are the largest in Ontario of a solely dedicated childcare local. We are leading a coordinated bargaining campaign aimed to raise the floor for all childcare workers in QP248 floor, including getting paid sick days, getting WSIB, paid programming time and paid professional development time. However, our efforts need to be in conjunction with strong municipal support. Our city and province are sleepwalking towards a crisis of our own making and one that will affect every family and the entire economy. My coworkers are at a breaking point. We've been pushed there by low wages, lack of sick days and poor working conditions. I'm calling on you to make the necessary investments in workers to ensure that children get the care they need and the workers get the conditions and wages we deserve. The Canada-wide Early Learning and Child Care Agreement was built on the backs of child care workers, the same ones that provide services in Toronto and Scarborough. We are the reason why Toronto has been able to survive crisis after crisis. Child care has carried Toronto and Scarborough through disasters, fires, recessions, war, and most recently, a global pandemic. Without ever shutting down as a sector, we actually intensified our work. Childcare and early learning professionals carried us from the onset of COVID without priority access to PPE or vaccinations and never received even one cent of pandemic pay, despite being some of us providing 24 hour care for hospital workers and for some of you city councillors. We are the pillars of our community and yet we are being run into the ground real time. I left my full-time job as an ECE just over a year ago and I was devastated. It was heartbreaking for me to keep every day separating naturally social children from each other for fear of them getting sick. I was cleaning and sanitizing toys with powerful chemicals at a constant rate. I had recently left an abusive relationship and after a particularly violent event, I left with nothing and as prices continued to rise, I was constantly reminded about the area. I was wondering if I was going to be able to pay for my kids to work, let alone for the entire community. I didn't want to stop working on the floor with children, but my mental health was struggling. And I was feeling immense guilt every day, pushing myself to the point of exhaustion, but feeling like a failure. I couldn't provide the quality of Jess, Jess, I'm sorry. It's it's uh, Councillor Crawford here. We're having difficulty hearing you. I don't know if you maybe speak a little clearer or closer to the mic, or turn off your camera. It's just sure. it... sorry about that. If yeah. You so I, I that's... no worries. I, I hopefully it's the mic or the camera off helps. I didn't want to stop working on the floor alongside my colleagues, but my mental health mental health was struggling. And I was feeling immense guilt every day from pushing myself to the brink of exhaustion, yet feeling like a failure because I couldn't provide the quality of programming I know children deserve. I was being shuffled from class to class, filling in gaps for folks who were sick with COVID or otherwise. And our sector has not been able to take proper vacation time in three years 
because staff shortages and legislated ratios are forcing us to continue running on empty. Now I'm doing everything I can to advocate for better working conditions so I can go back, so that thousands more educators can go back like myself. One of the phrases that keep coming up is that there's no recovery without a she recovery and that childcare is essential to bringing women back to strengthen our economy. And this is true. However, 97% of our childcare and early learning workforce identifies as women with racialized women primarily in the lowest paid positions. Two out of three ECEs work more than one job to make ends meet. And we will be short conservatively 8,500 ECEs by 2025 as put forth by the Ontario Financial Accountability Office. Why are we women being forced out of our careers with low wages and by no sick days and no benefits? The reality is we are on a path to warehousing children in less than, un, less than ethical conditions, packed to the brim with unqualified staff and for-profit expansion, getting public funds and funneled to them to build exclusive private wealth, all under the guise of a national child care plan. However, City of Toronto continues to be progressive in the working conditions for their own child care employees, which is amazing, yet you do not universally approve the same conditions for the rest of the childcare and early learning programs in Toronto. It's shameful that the city denies budgets that ask for the same conditions that their own workers are afforded. Budgets with similarly fulsome and enshrined wages and, and must be available for all early learning programs in, Ontario, in Toronto. We have the opportunity and billions of federal money to carry out the vision for childcare that decades of women have been advocating for. You have a duty to fix the current recruitment and retention crisis, but not with professional development. This is Rosalind Common. Rosalind, are you with us? Rosalind Common. Oh, yes. Um, Thank you. Let me know when my time is starting. You can start right now. Councillors, it is getting cold. Today I am speaking on behalf of Toronto, the Toronto Drop-In Network. We provide support to over 50 drop-ins and outreach organizations across the GTA. I'm talking today about and, and how the city has made a decision to, instead of opening up 24-hour drop-in centres, the city has decided that it will only open up when Weather Canada predicts negative 15 with the wind chill. In case the councillors are not aware, negative 15 is the temperature that lungs and skin start taking damage from the cold, and not much colder than that is when frostbite sets in within as little as 30 minutes. There are currently only 112 warming spaces in Toronto. That's less than half of the recommended 250. Why is the city relying upon a system that requires constant monitoring just to see if it's open? We have workers calling constantly these spaces just to ensure that, uh, just to try and see if we can, they can try and send their workers there, uh, their service users there. We understand that there's frustration. We, we all understand the frustration of attempting to access a service or business with temperamental hours, forcing this onto a neat uh, population that is just trying to access a service just so it can survive can only be described as cruel. While the city has pledged to put more outreach workers on the streets and in the TTC during extreme cold weather, what is the point of hiring on more workers when there aren't places to send them? There are thousands of people living on the streets in Toronto right now, and two weeks ago, faith leaders came to the mayor and called on him to do something about a man who froze to death on Christmas. The shelter system is so overburdened with, hundred, with over 100 callers being turned away every day. I hear stories all the time from members of our network who spend hours on the phone just to try and find uh, the most vulnerable of us, most vulnerable or citizenry space in a shelter. The fact that we are sitting here debating uh, this needed service while we heap money on a police force that has proven ex uh, very comfortable being exceedingly violent to ejecting ho uh, houseless people from encampments, frankly feels quite surreal. The city has been told all of this. Just two days ago, the Board of Health, which includes Councillor Claire Smoyce, declared a public health emergency. Bef uh, before that, there was an open letter signed by 1,500 healthcare workers calling for more centres to be opened sooner. Drop-ins pick up the slack when the city drops the ball, but there's only so much that we can do. Drop-in staff give clothing, TIM cards, and tokens, but frequently are forced to send service years out into extreme weather conditions when they close up for the day. Which, can, which I think we can all imagine takes quite the mental toll. 
The longer we fail to provide the bare minimum of shelter, the more permanent injuries are inflicted by the weather and the more deaths claim and will pop up in the news. Maybe the city has decided that with the increase in heat from global warming, it can relax some of its response to the harshness of winter. But I would then ask, where are the provisions for uh, the increasing heat in summer? My cooling centers and the water truck have not been included in this year's budget. Extreme heat contributes to 120 premature deaths every year in Toronto, and the houseless are even more at risk. With everything I have spoken on today, it would seem that the city is content to roll the dice on sa life-saving services, which flies in the city's pledge to safety by pledging $50 million to police. Therefore, we are asking the city to stop diverting funds to the police um, that have proven to be quite ineffective, uh, and instead provides uh, life-saving 24-hour warming and cooling spaces during months of extreme weather, from the months of November to April and June to September, respectively. We've heard many councillors over the, uh, I've heard many councillors ask the question of, well, where do people, uh, what about when people come to our services? I would point out that the city has a responsibility to take care of all of its citizens. And being worried about some theoretical boogeyman coming to steal our services is an easy way out of taking care of our citizens. We can't acknowledge that this province has just charged its responsibility to its citizenry. The question will, uh, the question is, will you? Personally, I have attended the houseless memorial over deaths from violent uh, from violent teenage girls to death by uh, fire and unsafe conditions, and from deaths in the housing shelter. Um, there are so many inequities that are being that are so apparent in this system, and just again, I refer to my earlier point about it feeling surreal that there's all of these issues that I think we can all see. And yet the two, uh, the only two uh, sectors that are getting increases are the police and the mayor's office. Thank you. Thank you. The last three speakers of this afternoon are Yvonne Wan, Anjali Gaur, and John Homer. Is Yvonne with us? Oh, there you are. Great. Welcome. Good afternoon. I guess the mic works. Okay. It does. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councillor. Thank you for giving me the opp opportunity to speak. My name is Yvonne Yuan. I'm a resident of Ward 21. The condo I live in and work in is next door to the Scarborough Civic Center where we are at today. I'm here today to urge you to invest in the TDC and to stop the prospective fare increase and service cuts. I have been a regular driver for six years, but before that, I'm an everyday TDC rider. I must admit to you that uh, driving my own vehicle has tremendously expanded my mobility and has empowered me. I no longer need to wait in the heat, in the rain, or on a freezing winter day for a bus that seemed like it took forever to show up. As a driver, I bid farewell to the times when the bus was so crowded that I didn't even need to hold on to the handle to retain my balance. I no longer need to experience the frustration I felt when the subway or RT stopped services, forcing me to follow the flow of equally frustrated transit travelers hoping to secure a seat on a shuttle bus. This is why it pains me even more to see that after all this year, TDC patrons will once again suffer from reduced services and security issues in public transit while facing the threat of a fare increase. Driving alone in my car is not a good solution for me or TDC patrons. It only means that we drivers are sufficiently privileged to, aff to afford a private vehicle, altering insurance, rising gas prices, etc. As a driver, I will welcome the sight of well-maintained buses with signal and lane priorities on their roads. I will gladly switch back to public transit, but the current set of disincentives, including increasing fares and reduced service, are appalling. The revenue generated through the proposed fare increase will not cover further losses. Instead of downloading the founding responsibility to every TTC rider, we need stable funding from the government. And through other revenue tools, like uh, my fellow speaker constantly mentioning the commercial parking levies on big malls and commercial landlords. Our way of saying thank you to the essential workers who have continued to use the transit during the pandemic should not be burdened with increases in the amount they need to spend on necessary everyday transportation. 
I implore you not to allow the pandemic to set a destructive course for a public transit future. Instead, in to increase ridership, lure people out of cars with cheaper and better services. It's just like what they said. Build it and they will come. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next is Anjali Gaur, who's on video conference. As I understand, you have somebody uh, with you, Anjali. I do, yes. Great. Uh, we're going gonna... to. My... Go ahead. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anjali Gaur. I'm the youth manager at Malvern Family Resource Center, an essential and trusted community hub that connects, engages, and takes collaborative action in supporting our communities to thrive. I just want to thank everyone for staying past the time today and for giving me the opportunity to speak with all of you today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the importance and the impact youth hubs have on communities and why funding youth hubs is essential for communities to thrive. Each year, my team has been providing youth development, leadership, recreational, and mental health programming and services to over 900 youth annually. Late last year, we opened a new youth hub in Malvern located at Sewells and Morningside that was co-created with and for youth. This hub is run by trained young staff from the community who relate to the real struggles that youth in Malvern and Scarborough are facing. The evidence of youth hubs effectiveness and cost effectiveness is growing with leaders such as Dr. Joanna Henderson and others. At the hub, we provide a large variety of programs and services, including but not limited to youth development programming, to teach youth valuable like transferable life skills such as leadership skills, public speaking, uh, offering employment some supports and much more. We also offer free mental health counseling for youth and their families, provide one-to-one -one case management supports, and we have a community peace engagement worker offering supports for youth directly in the justice system, pr uh, primarily those with lived experience with gun violence, which is very needed with the increase in violent activities in the city. Um, all of these programs and services are under one roof. It's a one-stop place for that's accessible to youth. Other than these programs and services, our Youth Hub is open Monday to Friday as a drop-in for youth to come and engage with each other and staff. Uh, we have a wide number of recreational activities for them to participate in, which allows staff to engage with youth while doing activities that they enjoy. Through the drop-in, we're also able to facilitate food security initiatives, including a cooking program on Fridays. By having all these programs and services in one space, it reduces the stigma associated with asking for help. If we have a youth who needs support in food security, they're more likely to come join our drop-in program where they know a free meal will be provided instead of going to a community agency asking for uh, support in buying groceries. That's just because there is still a lot of shame and guilt associated with asking for help. Even going to local community centers, there is a lot of stigma associated with that. It, it shows that you know there's something wrong with you. You might be living in poverty if you're going to seek these services. By having uh, all of these other recreational activities happening in the same space, it really reduces that stigma because youth are already going to these centers on a regular basis. The number one barrier youth face with getting help is not knowing about the resources and services out there. So having all of these resources and services within one space also allows youth to actively learn about the different resources that are available to them. Having more accessible youth spaces allows for these barriers to be lessened. Before I continue, I just wanted to pass it over quickly to my colleague Shaniqua. She is currently staffing our youth hub and she could talk directly about the differences that these spaces uh, can make within our community. Hi, hello everyone. Thanks, Angie. So as mentioned, my name is Shaniqua Wright and I'm a youth development worker with Malvern, Research, Malvern Family Research Center. Um, however, I did get my start with MFRC as a participant. Uh, that was back in summer of 2015. So I have perspective on both sides of the coin, being a participant and a staff member. Uh, so I truly understand why youth hubs and spaces are important. I think the reason I stayed connected with MFRC for almost eight years is because in a community such as Malvern, it's important to have a family outside of family. And 
that's what it's been for me. A youth hub would just enhance it and has been enhancing it here. Um, it's a space where youth can come in and watch movies, play games, eat snacks, um, do homework and just feel safe. Every Everything a youth should be able to do at home, but we all know that sometimes, unfortunately, unfortunately not the case. So I am one of the staff members who supervise the hub and I'm just you know, excited to bring a home away from home for our youth. And with that, I'll send it back over to Anjali to finish. Thank you. Thanks, Shaniqua. Um, you said it perfectly. Um, but Melbourne Family Resource Center's Youth Hub is meaningful and is already making some really great difference in the community. However, we know that more is needed. Uh, we know what more young people across Scarborough, um, sorry, we know that more people uh, across Scarborough and Greater Toronto need positive outlets, role models, and opportunities to thrive. And that's why we're really calling on this year's city budget to invest new dollars in support of the youth hubs such as ours. Uh, we know that youth, what youth need in Melbourne as well as in Scarborough and investments in new youth hubs can make a meaningful difference in their lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. And appreciate you both coming out. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor McKelvey has a question for you. Hi, thank you. Thank you for joining us, and I know you probably have youth in your center right now, so thanks for stepping away for a minute. Um, can you just maybe let us know, how much time do you need to activate a space once space becomes available? Um, for us, it really highly depends on staffing as well as other resources that are available to us. Um, luckily, we have a team of 12, and uh, we are we, we have a very full team who's able to actively be in that space to keep it running. Uh, we have active collaborations with other community agencies, such as Taibu, who I know was in here speaking earlier, um, the Toronto Public Library, uh, as well as the Melbourne Rec Centre to help pool in resources together as well. Um, so I would say once we have the space open, we would need maybe a week to, to actually get programming uh, all sorted out and having staff available. Once we're able to get that rolling, um, it it will take time to pick up because it's a brand new space. And the number one thing when working with youth is you have to build their trust. And part of that is them trusting the environment they're into. So if it's a brand new space that they're not already familiar with, it could take maybe a month or two for them to get more comfortable in that space. Do you think there's benefit to more smaller youth hubs you know, throughout Scarborough so that they're maybe located right in the community? Youth don't have to travel a long distance to get there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're very, um, we, we benefit quite greatly because we're in the heart of Melbourne. We're right across the street from Melbourne Mall. Um, but we have quite a few people that are coming all the way from Agent Court, um, where, where Woodside Square is located. And they do say that, you know, it takes them a while to come and take the bus here. Uh, but they're accessing programs and services where we're at. And I know that if there were more youth hubs available near them, they would definitely be be accessible over there too. Okay, thank you. Thanks for speaking with us today. Thank you very much. Um, thank you we, so much. We actually I just I just informed two of the previous speakers at the beginning who weren't here are now here. So we're gonna we now have three more to listen to. Uh, first is John Homer, then uh, Nazma Kanam, and then Dave McDermott will end off. John, are you with us? Trials and tribulations of technology. Okay, let's, uh, John, John doesn't appear to be here, but we'll try Nazma. Nazma, are you with us? Oh. Welcome. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. I, yeah, we're, we're finding it difficult to hear you, Nazma. I'm just wondering if you could maybe turn off yeah. your camera. Hello. Hello. We're finding it hard to hear you, Nazma. Can you turn off your camera and just speak to us um, verbally? It's okay. I think your papers may be over the microphone, maybe the problem. Okay, yeah. We can hear you now, yes. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. 
Okay, good afternoon, members of the budget committee. Uh, so my name is Nazma Akhtar Khanom. I am a resident, uh, resident from the West Scarborough neighborhood. I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. So today I am here to speak about increasing transfer period on the on Pestro card. This issue matters to the because one way trip from one end of a line to another can take more than two hours. Is it, is, is, is the TTC delay? TTC delay. So in, in conclusion, I recommend that you, you will increase the transfer period free transfer period from two to three hours on single ride using pesto card. This is for uh, 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 giving me the more time. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Nazma. Uh, next is Dave McDermott. Are you with us, Dave? Good afternoon. Yes, I am. Hello. Great. You have up to five minutes. Go ahead. Before I start my greeting, I'd like to say, hey, Mr. Soundman, <clears throat> please get out of the booth. Your one hertz is distorting on the council mics. You got to get out of the booth, listen to a phone and listen how the one hertz is distorting because your input volume is too high. Just modulate it a bit as per the speaker on the council's inputs only. Anyways, does anybody hear this besides me? Uh, does anybody hear a tree falling? Okay, so thanks again for this opportunity, Council Cra Councilor Crawford and Budget Council, and thank you very much for all the hard work you guys are doing here and the public who care and are contributing. And with taxes in in many ways by caring and coming to the meeting. So, um, first of all, I'd like to point out, I don't know if you got me on cam here. Let's put on cam. There we go. Uh, allow, okay. So just if you can see behind me, I'm the only guy here who's got greenery behind me. You guys have all got curtains. I don't know if that's an indication for the human race or what, but my first priority, you're asking for first priorities and directions and things for the council meetings decisions. Um, how long ago uh, did I suggest a $1 natural tax credit so that at tax time, people can say, hey, what's this about a natural tax credit for $1? I can have a tax credit for one dollar. Why is that? I got a natural garden. Oh, interesting. So to encourage that. Now, listen, counselor, did I suggest natural garden encouragement? You picked up on it. You encouraged natural gardens. You were already a gardener. You said, yes, good idea. You pulled in Pat Landry. Thank you very much. Your help has assisted in my natural garden. Now I got one, which is provincially and municipally recognized. And that's great. Um, it's a natural diverse pollinator garden after seven years of municipal inquisitions, which they're unable to tell me how much that costs fighting my tall grass and weeds, which didn't exist. But we won't get into the municipal issues except to ask you for, is there a possibility of a law which would provide for only green parking for senior citizens assisted and disabled on the lawn next to the lift where the charging station is. So a greenhouse covered, strong charging parking station only for green, only on green. None of this tar extension stuff. I'm seeing a lot of it and I got a hundred examples of it. Oh, we could blow the municipal inspection budgets very quickly, but I won't be too interested in that. Anyways, I now have a natural diverse pollinator garden. Thanks with the help also of Councillor Crawford. And as I said in council chambers the last time you sat in my natural garden, I said, do I have a natural garden? You said, yes, you do. So, and so did Dolly. And so does everyone almost except for the chronic complainer, which who generates great amounts. But anyways, uh, I am a naturally dense person. Call me simple, please. And easy and cheap. Call me cheap. Yes. Well, I've sent you several emails, Councillor Crawford. I'm quite sure you're well aware of what I've asked about the greenhouse roofs for food security. As I mentioned to, da to Mayor Brampton a couple of weeks ago on a David Suzuki Zoom Live, I said, you guys need greenhouse roofs for food security. 
I'm here in greenhouse roofs at a lot of solutions for these housing things that everybody's mentioning, but nobody's mentioned that. I spent time in locations for film on the top of University of Toronto, looking at the stars along with the stars, enjoying the beautiful greenhouse roofs that they have there. They got them downtown. They got greenhouse roofs here and there. Oh, and around the world. Let's mention other places around the world where they actually grow food on their roofs right at home without transportation costs. Yeah, I mentioned it to like six franchisees, potential franchisees at No Frills. I said, you guys could have a produce section in W area upstairs. You can't do it. You don't own the building. Build one. Come on. So anyways, you've had the chance to make these changes. Changes was a buzzword in the, uh, in the Bluffs monitor there. Changes, changes, changes. I've been talking about them for eight years. I'm wondering if you had the chance to consider doing anything about the chance to consider thinking about doing anything about. You know, it's funny. I hear students worried about their facial recognition wearing masks. I spent the time on top of the University of Toronto looking at the stars. My good friend always said, try and put the ball in the other court for their solutions to identify the problems. You took half an hour on another issue. You ain't got no time to think about human survival. Ask you guys, the council, how you intend to solve the problems, why we don't have any more greenhouse roofs. Ask you guys to be involved directly well, in implementing social you'll have solutions. You'll have to wrap up, Dave. You. You'll have to wrap up, Dave. Almost at your five minutes. And ask me to I'm willing to entertain your questions for the next half an hour. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that, Dave. Uh, we, seeing no questions, appreciate your time with us today. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have questions, but it's the future. Thank you. Just uh, one. Do we have John Homer here? Uh, John, no, we don't see him in the room. Okay, we don't have John in the room. Okay. We are... Oh, we need have a motion to accept the presentations for the budget process. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Okay, we're recessed or adjourned or whatever till adjourned to 6 p.m. Brand new meeting at 6 p.m. Thanks, everyone.